Okay, let us begin. Thank you everyone uh, for coming uh, to this event. My name is Brian Nosek. I'm executive director of the Center for Open Science and I'm the faculty at the University of Virginia. Today, uh, symp this symposium is a preview event uh, of the upcoming uh, virtual conference called MetaScience 2021 that will occur in September. Feel free during the course of this event to use the hashtag MetaScience 2021 if you wanna chat about this in uh, social media uh, and sign up uh, for the uh, information about that meeting uh, at the link uh, that Claire will provide uh, in the chat for you if you wanna hear more about topics like these uh, coming in September. The title of this symposium is a critical analysis of the scientific reform movement. And today we will have five presenters with very diverse uh, perspectives in analyzing reform, its conceptualization, its approach, its impact, and its implications. As a social system, of course, science is always evolving and reforming. The last 10 years has been a particularly intense period of reform with an emphasis on open scholarship, open access, preprints, pre-registration, sharing of data, materials, and code, open review, and examining the dysfunctions in the research culture for incentives, rewards, and inclusion. That reform is usually motivated by good intentions and idealism. We can do better, right? We can improve, we can fix things. And that idealism is a strength for motivating efforts to change and rallying stakeholders around common causes. But it's also a risk for blinding and blocking appreciation of the unintended consequences of change and who is affected uh, by those consequences. For example, the ideals of reform might be superficially conceived in theory and never have a chance to meet their intended aims. The ideals of reform might be narrowly conceived and not translate well across research domains and methodologies that reformers wish to apply it. The ideals of reform might be conceptualized inclusively but fail to take into account the full range of identities and circumstances and points of view uh, to which it's intended to apply. The ideal, ideals of reform might articulate the positive implications of the new behaviors, but fail to anticipate the negative consequences. It is very rare that there are no trade-offs between sets of practices. And the ideals of reform might be perfectly well conceived in theory, but fail in their implementation, their translation to practice. In some culture and behavior change movements, knowing what to do is the easy part. <laughs> Developing an effective strategy is starting to do it, do it well, make it sustainable uh, is the hard part. All of these challenges inevitably play out in scientific reform. Our initial conceptualization of how we think the system works, the solutions for how to make it work better will be upended, revised and improved by the reality confronted when those solutions are implemented. If we knew all the answers beforehand, we, we wouldn't need research. So with all of this complexity, a continuous critical analysis of reform efforts will maximize their chances for clarifying their goals and then achieving uh, their vision. So with that, let's turn to our outstanding panel of presenters. Uh, as quick housekeeping, I'll make very brief introductions for each presenter. Each of them will speak for 15 minutes and then have five minutes for Q&A after their presentation. As you are listening, please feel free to enter, use the Q&A box uh, and enter questions and upvote questions of others uh, that you would like uh, to see the speakers address. Uh, Claire and I will curate those for the presenter during the QA period. And also feel free to pose, pose broader questions that will be relevant to the whole panel because after each person has presented, we'll have 20 or 30 minutes or so to have a open panel discussion for cross-cutting themes across their presentations. In total, we expect that this webinar will run for about uh, two and a half hours. Uh, but if you miss any parts, don't worry. Uh, the, uh, this is being recorded. We'll make a link available and uh, there will be an OSF project with all of the uh, presentation materials as, as well available that we will circulate. Okay, so that's it. Uh, let's begin uh, with our first speaker. Ivan Fliss is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Psychology at the Catholic University of Croatia, and he will start us off. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for having me. Um, okay, let's share my presentation. 
this should work, I think. Okay. Um, okay, so um, today I'm, I'm gonna talk um, about um, my perspective on the reform, uh, which comes from most broadly history of psychology and history of science. Um, and I participated in the reform debates a bit with my paper that I published in 2019, Psychologists, Psychology and Scientific Psychology. And I, I've been working for a couple of years now on a continuation of that paper, uh, which is the function of uh, literature in psychological science. So this talk is kind of this continuation of thinking. Historians of psychology and historians of science are terribly slow to publish, so it takes years to write papers. Um, okay, so what is the perspective of historians of psychology? A number of historians of psychology have been attracted to the conversations about replication crisis in the reform movement. And I identified here three commentators who actually published on it. As I said, historians of psychology are slow to publish, so it take, takes us some time, even if something develops for a decade. Um, and I identified three papers which really come from this perspective of historians of psychology here. My paper that I already mentioned, uh, John Morawski's paper from 2020 in History of Psychology, um, and uh, a recent preprint that was just published by Martin Dirksen um, and a really brilliant young meta scientist, uh, Sarah Ann Field, um, which all kind of come from this perspective of talking about the scientific self. And what is the scientific self when historians of science talk about it? Um, it's basically this idea that scientists develop a certain persona that's invested with values, ethical values, but also epistemic values in how they handle themselves and discuss with each other and basically go about in their communities. And communities enforce these values uh, and kind of um, train or educate it pedagogically um, their uh, disciplinary members into these forms of scientific selves. And I think all these three papers that we wrote from very different perspectives kind of engaged with this idea of what kind of scientific self is being developed within these new reform debates that are happening. Um, and what I'm, what I'm gonna try to do in this, this talk is um, uh, latch onto this idea of the scientific self and actually bridge it to the idea of what is the scientific literature uh, and what kind of scientific self should we have to serve particular functions or goals when it comes to adding and expanding and maintaining a scientific literature of a, of a, uh, of a discipline. Um, so my talk is going to be about polemics, identity, community, and literature in a way. Um, and I identified the argument uh, to keep it uh, simple and also to, for us, all of us to be on the same page. Uh, this is the argument that I'm basically going to make in the, in the talk. Um, the idea of polemical disagreement, um, and compare this to Dirksen and Field's paper that I just managed, where they call it manage the census. Um, the the pole polemical disagreement about the overarching sources of problems in psychological science generate new identities for a researcher. So this polemical conversation that's happening um, under the umbrella term of, of a crisis basically, uh, basically uh, forms or generates uh, new ways of being a scientist. The new kind of a researcher is basically an answer to the identified source of problems. Uh, and uh, in the case of the reform movement that started in 2010s, that's basically the, the replicationist reformer, as I call it, uh, or her. Uh, the identity is performed through social media and attracts a community. So social media is really crucial as a social technology that allows for this identity to be performed, to be presented, and for other people to actually to learn how to do it and uh, start doing it themselves, so to build a community around the identity. Um, and what happens with the identity of co and community, this pair of identity and community, is that it may have spillover offline. It's intended to have spillover offline to actually affect the research institutions and the systems that are trying to be affected. Um, and rupture presents a reimagined way for interacting with the psychological re literature to a quasi-global audience of researchers in psychology. And this quasi-global audience uh, is basically really important because considering the many communities of psychologists around the world, uh, the literature is only the only point of interaction for everybody, basically. So the ways that we form new identities that allow us to interact with the literature in a particular way are the ways that we can participate in all of this. And uh, in the talk, I'm going to call these overarching sources of problems myths. So things that were uh, accepted before, but are identified as problematic now. The first myth is the myth of self-correction. Um, I think most of us are going to be familiar with this idea because, because it's articulated in the reform movement. And the second myth I'm going to propose is the myth of self-organization. 
Um, the first is coupled with the identity of the replication as freeformer, um, and the second is coupled with what I call the pre-registration skeptic. You'll see what I mean with that later. So the reform debates central to these community identity, identity ruptures identified through the function of the psychological literature basically function something like this. So up to the 2000s, uh, we have what in the reform literature is usually called status quo psychologists, uh, who basically saw the scientific literature as self-correcting and self-organizing if the methods that are used to produce that literature are sound. Uh, and soundness, soundness of method is something that's a product of the history of the discipline within the 20th century. I don't have time to go into that. What the replicationist reformers did in the 2010s and late 2000s is actually criticize this soundness of method and also criticize the idea that the literature is going to be self-correcting uh, regardless of the method. So the idea is that the scientific literature needs to be continuously corrected to self-organize. And the, the key word here is robust methods. So we need to apply robust methods, and we also need to police the literature in order for it to be corrected so it can self-organize and organize psychological knowledge. And um, the last break, um, I think, happened within the last couple of years with a pushback from the reform movement itself or the, the people participating in the conversations with the, within the reform movement from pre-registration skeptics. So folks saying that maybe pre-registration, which was central for the replication of reformers, is not uh, so successful in uh, fixing the literature. And the idea was that the literature needs to be organized around a body of theory or some other kind of formalism to benefit from what the replication as reformers would call robust hypothesis testing. So without this core of something that's already organized for the communities, all the improvements uh, by the replication as reformers are not going to succeed. Um, so what is the literature for the community of replication as reformers? And this is something that I read off and I'm very open to criticizing it and saying, you know, you got it completely wrong. So the scientific literature should be a collection of true effects in a way, uh, and this really mimics the, the quantified do dominance of the quantified perspective. These true effects are presented and argued for individual studies, the studies appear in journals, the effects must be robust according to the current reform consensus about, robust about robustness, so the community defines this new robustness replicable, reproducible, developed according to principles of open science, of transparency in data analysis publication. And usually when inferential statistics is used, it is argued that studies in this literature should conform to some type of hypothetical deductivism or neo popperian falsificationisms that seem to be really prominent and uh, have traction in the reform community. Uh, this reconstruction of mine of what is the literature in the view of the replication as reformer basically comes from the debates about the meaning of the first large scale uh, replications. Uh, it comes from the wider open science movement and its practices for increasing transparency in psychology. And it's important here to mention that open science and replication as reform are not one of the same, one and the same. So they have their own social dynamics. They're meshed together in psychology. But the open science movement is something with a different history, and and it 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 it's kind of connected, but it's a different social system, so to say. And the third thing that actually informs this kind of reconstruction that I came up with the literature is meta science, the basically empirical branch of the reform movement that's try, trying to produce evidence based interventions to fix the literature. Right? What are the implications of dismantling the method of lit literature self correction from the by the replicationist reformers? Um, the replication of three formers attempt to salvage the idea of the literature as a proxy for the substantive, uh, are trying to salvage the idea of the literature as a proxy for the substantive structure of science. So they're really continuing this idea of status quo psychologists that there is a structure within the literature and that adding to the literature adds to this structure and that this structure really reflects what is psychological knowledge. In this view, the literature is psychological knowledge. So maintaining a good structure or an informative or true structure of the literature is maintaining psychological knowledge. And uh, by way of that, the literature requires constant policing and pruning by enforcers of, robust of robustness. And those enforcers can be individuals, but we can also come up with ways to develop different institutions or prop up institutions that already exist to actually enforce this idea of robustness. So, uh, this is what happened, I think, during the 2010s. And uh, in late 2010s, in the past few years, I think the conversation experienced a really strong rupture. I identified the central paper, I think, for this rupture. At the end, I, I'm going to have a whole list of papers that you can connect to this, the, these perspectives that I'm arguing about. Um, and these conversations about pre-registration generated, I would argue, a new identity community rupture from the reform movement that happened in the late 2000s. 
Um, and uh, what is this rupture? What is the literature for pre-registration skeptics? So just uh, to sum it up, I'm not gonna, I don't have much time, but pre-registration skeptics are people, basically folk scientists who are saying that pre-registration doesn't actually um, uh, solve the problem of cumulativity or, uh, um, or producing sound theory in psychology and the focus on replication uh, is not the way to go to actually fix the problems uh, in psychological science. So they're moving from the myth of self-correction to the, the, what I call the myth of uh, attacking the myth of uh, self-organization of the literature. So in this view, the scientific literature is a collection of scientific outputs. These outputs can be varied, empirical, theoretical, commentary, opinion. They appear in journals uh, and they can vary in quality and epistemic norm according to which they were produced. So the literature is actually an, uh, um, a place where a lot of epistemic regimes in different communities produce and add stuff into. It's not dominated by one uh, way of doing things or one set of norms, basically. Because why is this possible? Because the literature just represents fuel for a substantive conversation among scientists. So it's not supposed to mimic the structure of science and it's not supposed to um, be kind of a, a, kind of a, a homological thing for psychological knowledge. It's supposed to be fuel for something that scientists are doing somewhere else than the literature. And what's that in the conversation for the most part? part formalized theories. So formalized theories are supposed to feed on the literature and feed into the literature, but are not represented by it. Um, where does my reconstruction of these, this view come from? Uh, the positions articulated in response to the institution of pre-registration. So these conversations that have been happening in the past few years, uh, as I said, uh, I cited papers that I think are relevant at the end of the talk. From the perspective of cognitive scientists, cognitive modelers and mathematical psychologists who are participating uh, on, some would say fringes of the reform, but I think also I, this fringe center is very, really problematic to argue for, but it's cognitive scientists, cognitive models and mathematical psychologists for the most part, participating in reform conversations and realizing that the epistemic norms of their communities do not mesh so well with what's dominant in the reform. Um, and this resulted in calls for theory formalization in psychology that are now already broader than just cognitive scientists, cognitive modelers, and mathematical psychologists. So there's multiple calls for theory for formalization within this conversation. What are the implications of dismantling the myth of literature self-organization? Uh, as I said, the literature in this view is not a proxy for the structure of science. The literature is not psychological knowledge. Psychological knowledge is some body of collectively developed formalized theory, be it quantitative or non-quantitative. So it's something cumulative that's separate from the literature itself. It can be found in the literature, but it's not the structure of the literature. Psycho psychologists need to develop new practices for systemizing knowledge, which are not just lit literature reforms. And I think this is truly revolutionary in that sense. And that's why it doesn't mesh with this reform view of fixing up the institutions that are already there, because it means that many communities need to really fundamentally change the practices of their research, uh, research and the goals that they have in doing research to add something completely new and completely different to make the science cumulative from the perspective of theory. Um, and by way of conclusion, I have um, at the end some sociological aspects uh, that, that can be drawn from this analysis. And also I'm gonna finish with two questions instead of a conclusion, of course, historians never conclude anything, they just ask questions, I think. Um, okay, uh, so sociological aspects of my analysis, me, uh, the first one is that um, social media are a cr crucial uh, social technology that's being used in this conversa these conversations, and it has epistemic value. So it's not only this ephemeral thing that's happening on the, on the edges, but what's happening on primarily Twitter, Facebook, and other places in these groups of people, uh, it's actually crucial to this forming of identity and forming of community and how this translates into practice. So disentangling social media from this conversation is not gonna be easy. Um, me as a commentator, and I think all STS scholars, historians, philosophers who work on this are really struggling with how to label things here because we know that labels have huge power in organizing groups of people and their thinking. So I really kind of struggle with, do I name people a radical, off-stream, pre-registration skeptic? So these labels are, in my analysis, I don't mean uh, any formal card carrying that, that, that are former card carrying members of these groups. They're just kind of useful fictions that I use for doing the analysis. Mm, an interesting thing in this second rupture is also that it re revealed an, an interesting gender din dynamic and a diversity dynamic, because the second rupture of the pre-registration skeptics uh, included uh, basically uh, ideas that, that 
there's a problem with diversity within the reform movement, and not only diversity in the political sense, but also epistemic diversity. Um, okay, I don't have much time for the other ones, so I'm not going to go into uh, the last three because I'm going to run over time. My two questions I would like to finish with are basically, um, okay, the timer is done. Um, where will the call for theoretical formalization lead? And what is the capacity of psychological science at large to employ theory formalization? I think that's a really big question that needs to be hashed out because the history of psychology of the 20th century wasn't that people didn't think that they need uh, formalized theory, but that they really deeply struggled with how to do it in their subject matter specialties. So this realization has existed, I would say for a century, maybe less, uh, but it's really hard to do. So I'm really interested with what's gonna come out of this conversation with the actual practical applications of theory formalization. And my second question is, will mainstream reform stop centering replication? So is there really a rupture in the myth uh, uh, that the dominant myth, myth is not self-correction anymore, but self-organization and move to theory or some other articulation of the goal of cumulativity? Or will we actually see separate communities of anti-status quo psychologists who are centering um, their ideas of cumulativity instead of replication? Okay, I ran a bit over time. At the end of the talk, you can find references related to history of science that informed my perspective, and also references to the papers within the reform conversations that are kind of, I use to build up this argument. Uh, thank you very much. Ivan, thank you for that excellent kickoff uh, to this symposium. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have already been posted. Everyone else should feel free to continue to add uh, questions in the Q&A or in the chat uh, if it's possible to see that. Uh, I will uh, pose the first one from Ignazio Ziano uh, in the chat. He asks, uh, is it possible there is more nuance in the perceived relationship between knowledge and the literature? Perhaps some people believe there is not 100% overlap between the two, but the literature represents some form of psychological knowledge, perhaps not all, for instance. Yeah, I, I think it's qu there's quite a bit of nuance in that. Uh, there's actually a really long story. Uh, where do these two myths of uh, self-correction and um, um, so, uh, self-organization come from within the history of psychology, especially in the late 20th century in the US? Uh, so some uh, epistemic norms and methods really informed the way that um, psychologists basically started behaving about their literature. There's quite a bit of nuance here, I think. Um, that I kind of glossed over because I don't have much time to go into it, uh, but I'm trying to uh, identify really like extreme ruptures that kind of gather positions, right? Uh, so I'm, I find it really difficult uh, to be in this position of ascribing uh, positions to individuals. That's why I didn't cite individual papers in my argument, because I don't want to be in this position where people say I never said that, right? So I'm trying to kind of identify general trends. And we can, we can argue about that, whether the general trend that, that I identified actually glosses over nuance that is super important for the argument itself. Yeah. Great, thank you for that, Ivan. Uh, another question comes from Matthias Lobo. Uh, he asks, Amazon invented self-publication of books. What is your view about researchers in the field creating self-publication journals eventually with post-publication peer review? The purpose I, in this case would be to publish correct results instead of important results, pretty much like the publisher Frontiers is doing for the last decade. I, I think here I would really recommend reading um, a more recent history of scientific publishing uh, because it's actually full of ideas and it's gonna, it really opened my mind in how malleable through time the publishing system is. Uh, and actually, um, as a historian, I'll, I'm always the most excited by really radical pr propositions coming from the reform. So not the reformist one of propping up journals and peer review and stuff like that, but actually completely rethinking uh, how does the item of publication function in itself. Uh, so yeah, I think those initiatives are really exciting. Uh, and I think we should really have more of them. So I think there is space to be more radical in reimagining the literature and trying to translate that in, into mainstream research. Yeah. Great, thank you, Ivan. We are about at time, but I'll ask you one more to get your 20 second response. And those other questions that have come up, we can revisit in the later discussion. So keep posting those folks. Uh, from Bobby Spellman, do you have any thoughts about age differences and people's views about what they believe should be done and what has been good or bad about these reforms? Um, I think, I'm not sure if I would ascribe it to age differences, I would ascribe it to 
um, um, in investment into the institutions that are being brought down or are be, being criticized. So I think there is this really dynamic of an old guard who has a lot to lose versus people who are trying to make a name for themselves in a really new landscape in that. And I think that generates a lot of antagonism. Uh, but I think that's also a dynamic process that's not unique to the reform movement. So I think that's a dynamic process that you see in the social functioning of all sciences uh, since we were generating knowledge in communities of researchers, right? So yeah, I can see it but I wouldn't center it in that sense. I think this social media aspect is much more interesting than the, the one of uh, old versus young in that sense. Great. Thank you very much, Ivan, for the presentation and for uh, those responses. Uh, you should feel free to uh, respond to some of the questions that have come up in the chat and the Q&A uh, dynamically, uh, and things may come up later in the session. Sure. Uh, for now, we will move on uh, to our next presenter, Sabina Leonelli. She is the co-director of the Exeter Center for the Study of the Life Sciences and a professor of philosophy and history of science at the University of Exeter. Sabina, thanks for joining us. I'm sorry, there you are. <laughs> this had to happen at least once today. Uh, so as I was saying, I'm delighted to be part of this conversation. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I guess the perspective I'm bringing here is of um, a subfield of the history and philosophy of science called philosophy of science in practice, where there is a lot of work being done collaboratively uh, with researchers in different domains uh, to address what we are here calling the scientific reform and the implications that this may have and the different types of changes may have on scientific practice and um, this is very often mostly done from the qualitative perspective or doing very in-depth um, studies of what is happening in everyday practices which range from publishing to a uh, lab work to um, everyday embodied um, daily activities involved in research and in that sense i would agree with one of the people that was uh, asking the question in the chat it is true that i think this kind of more qualitative approaches tend to be sidelined uh, when it comes to thinking about um, how to develop um, scientific reforms and also what role meta science has in this so i'm particularly happy that um, we can have this wide-ranging discussion today in thinking about how to correct for this. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about is very broadly uh, the implementation of open science and some of the controversies and some of the questions that are arising in relation to that. And I guess uh, one of my starting points is to acknowledge the fact that there has been a lot of work, a lot of scholarships covering different types of trouble happening in science, particularly when one thinks about scientific research in a global context, in a transnational context, which is highly diverse. And uh, there's been uh, literature documenting the extent of inequity between uh, research environments in which different types of researchers are working and how this in fact uh, affects their ability to publish and to produce research. Uh, very often also in cases where um, in highly excellent um, research environments, actually they're not uh, as visible and as well noted as others already are by reputation and by location and by resources. Um, there is a big problem with incentive systems, um, very diverse, uh, even within uh, the European Union. We have, um, you know, supposedly uh, systems that are able to talk to each other and yet a huge diversity, which very often is not acknowledged or even understood by researchers themselves and sometimes even by institutions, and this can create problems. Various forms of discrimination, of course, there's been a lot of discussion around these, uh, particularly in recent years. And to some extent, a lack of accountability and a lack of public trust and, and understanding of what that may mean in relation to research and a general tendency to have a short-term understanding of what benefits uh, we achieve through um, the carrying out of research. So um, this is generating a kind of widely, like um, it's, it's been related to um, several problems with the communication of science. And this is partly to do with what has been dubbed a highly self-referential uh, academic discourse, uh, the fact that research outputs uh, were um, valued 
um, in, mostly in terms of where they would be published rather than their quality, potential, and the reproducibility, the dominance of publication in high impact factor journals, um, the fact that the parasitic industry was organized in a way that was uh, widely parasitic on publicly funded research. And also a very strong uh, emphasis on how the power centers in research, particularly on the Anglo-American world, uh, at least so far, of course, we're seeing now the rise of other powers in research, is creating all sorts of uh, uh, sources of discrimination and dominance um, in the making of research. Um, uh, science has been widely documented within science studies, is uh, highly dependent on uh, reputation and reputation cycles. How reputations are actually grown is one of the most important um, credit systems often in science, but this is highly rigged towards popular and well-funded institutions. And of course, uh, this also generates um, dominance of STEM subjects uh, which are typically more visible, uh, typically better funded for all sorts of reasons, over um, subjects which are uh, more belonging in qualitative traditions in the humanities and the social sciences and the arts. And generally there has been uh, work on the lack of incentives at the moment for the responsible sharing and approaches of, of um, of research outputs and components, the diversification of approaches that we might have in science and uh, the importance of actually keeping this diversity and acknowledging this, uh, the transdisciplinary and transnational nature of collaborations and community building that are uh, so helpful to developing science, public engagement and different forms of co-production and focusing on social challenging. And in fact, uh, most importantly, having venues and opportunities to question what the social challenges that matter to science are and to choose a wide variety of stakeholders that can help us engage with that questioning. So open science has been widely seen as a potential solution to uh, some of these issues and particularly the, I think focusing on open data for a moment will be helpful uh, to focus our mind on this. Um, data have acquired a new prominence as research outputs over the last 30 years or so. They're increasingly recognized as valuable in their own right, which is quite different from the idea of uh, data as being valuable only because they allow us to provide evidence of a particular claim. Uh, they've been made increasingly mobile and they're increasingly being reused. Um, and this is really central to the value of the data in the first place, the ability to move around and to shift context. And uh, in fact, that meant that the relationship between data and articles, and also the credit assigned to the production of data and the production of articles, has needed to be um, in very widely redefined. Uh, also, this emphasis on data and uh, opening up and mobilizing data has meant uh, a spotlight on the very significant amount of resources that are required to be able to responsibly share and reuse data and that are very often lacking, particularly in places where uh, research environments are not quite as well funded and visible as others. And of course, it's also brought, um, all of this has also brought an emphasis of how important it is to uh, manage uh, data responsibly and effectively. And I guess uh, particularly in light of the pandemic response and uh, the COVID situation, we've seen this very clearly. Um, this can bring to a global transformation of how we do research and how we think about research in relation to decision-making and ensuring equitable participation in the creation of knowledge is absolutely crucial to then creating um, effective results and reliable results that can uh, provoke um, social change across um, different parts of society. And this, of course, also means uh, rethinking policy funding evaluation practices. So under which conditions can all of this work? This is where the emphasis on implementation of open science comes. Uh, Brian's um, introduction was perfect in that sense. I mean, the problem here is how to implement some of these ideals. And there's been a wide amounts of disagreements uh, around how this could be done. Uh, I think what people tend to agree on is the fact that these changes, the reform proposed by open science as a global scope affects all stages of the research process. It has a systemic reach and it really uh, requires change in all parts of the scientific system and needs to have a local implementation. So um, depending on the discipline, depending on the type of researchers that are being affected, their location, uh, the ways in which they're working, um, the, open, the implementation of open science um, will need to change and adapt. 
And this is, of course, a key worry for the researchers, particularly, uh, because there is a tendency still now to think about open science uh, guidelines and policies as overarching and to some extent universal. And this creates a huge amount of worries and resistance also among research communities around what this will mean in practice. So this is something that uh, I've investigated with my group for a number of years now, uh, doing empirical research on the meanings and practices of openness across different research communities, particularly biology and biomedicine. And to do this, we used um, interviews and ethnographic fieldwork, uh, listening to researchers talking about their perspectives on openness. And this is really a variety of um, researchers across uh, different kinds of seniority and different types of location, thinking about what are the perceived obstacles to openness and particularly open and data, what are the existing problems in taking advantage of um, existing um, tools uh, to implement open science and to carry out open science, like data infrastructures, for instance, and the huge amount of confusion that exists around um, the intellectual property regimes uh, surrounding open science, uh, legal, ethical concerns, and the very semantics of what we mean by openness. This has also been done in collaboration with a range of policy initiatives in this area. For instance, I participated in the Open Science Policy Platform that was organized by the European Commission between 2016 and 2020, which brought together many of the relevant stakeholders and scholarly societies. And also a, a mutual learning exercise that was carried out uh, by the European Commission, looking specifically at incentives uh, for open science. And that included uh, consultations um, over the course of a year with representatives of scientific systems from very different countries within Europe at various levels of resourcing um, for the scientific system. So here is a list of the key challenges that we found uh, to exist in this field and to require very urgent tackling. Uh, one, of course, is the idea of uh, how does one enhance and even rethink the skills and the training needed to form researchers in light of this proposed reform. Uh, what does it mean in terms of distributing the costs and accountabilities uh, for the systems? Very often, uh, the weight of the reform is actually put on the shoulders of individual scientists. But in fact, it turns out, and I think this is uh, demonstrated at many different studies, uh, that institutions and uh, funding bodies uh, have, in fact, uh, a very strong uh, responsibility here in terms of making it possible for people to uh, implement um, these changes if they wish. Um, there is a real question around how does one adapt intellectual property regimes and one, one confronts the semantic ambiguity that is intrinsic to open science. In fact, uh, we noted that looking at the variety of definitions that people provide of openness, open science and open data is a source of wonderful ideas for how uh, these ideas can be implemented across different practices in different contexts and trying to erase that diversity is really the last thing we want to do. And in fact, that brings me to the uh, key point that I want to make here, the importance of recognizing and promoting diversity in research in relation to uh, the open science reforms that are being proposed, which in fact would bring to uh, attempts to counter the high resource bias that we see at the moment in how open science is being implemented and also integrating ethical and social concerns into how we are uh, carrying out um, these implementation systems. So I want to focus just briefly to conclude on the question around recognizing and promoting diversity in research. And this, I think, starts from trying to identify and think and debate the, what constitute relevant forms of local variability uh, across different environments in research that may result in epistemic diversity. So diversity that actually is relevant and is constitutive to the making of uh, knowledge and to the production of science. And this, of course, starts from differences in research assessment and credit systems. This really, uh, we found, have uh, the, uh, by far the strongest effect on how researchers uh, end up implementing open science, especially in situations where, in fact, many researchers tend to be uh, extremely sympathetic to the idea of open science, but then find that it's very, very difficult to um, uh, implement this in their own research, given the kind of credit structures and promotion structures that their work is subject to.
Um, another source of local variability, which is extremely important, is the geopolitical location. So what kind of political regimes uh, are researchers working under? What are the constraints uh, relating to that? Um, what are the um, potential conflicts between the institutions researchers are working for and with, both at the national and the international level, and uh, what their responsibilities are vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, their national context and vis-a-vis -vis their collaborators? What are the values and the goals that different kinds of researchers are trying to implement in their work? There is a huge body of literature in philosophy of science that addresses this and relates the values implemented in science to um, the content of the science itself. What are the capacities that research environments actually provide for researchers to implement these ideals? What kind of infrastructures are available? And how are these actually accessed? So very often there is an emphasis on open science providing wonderful infrastructures, which are indeed present and accessible through the internet. But many researchers in different parts of the world are having huge differences, um, huge difficulties, in fact, in having the kind of stable broadband connection and access to software that allows them to make the best out of these resources. Also, very often these resources are developed largely by researchers based in the global north, with less consultation happening with researchers based in um, uh, less visible research environments, which again creates a cycle of uh, these researchers being discriminated in the systems. Um, big problems around mobility and assumptions about mobility. I think the pandemic has brought this point home in a huge way, because of course now many of us are stranded, whether or not we are based in institutions, we will fund our travel and we will fund uh, the um, movement of materials we may use for our research. And of course, again, the question around what kind of institutional support is expected, what is the balance between teaching and research that characterizes expectations around um, uh, researchers work in different institutions, and so on and so forth. Obviously, questions around funding here are absolutely essential. And uh, here we're thinking about long term funding, not just shorter term. It's also very important to note that there are many disciplines where external funding is not the key mode of uh, supporting research. And this, of course, affects particularly the social sciences and the humanities. So reforms that are uh, put forward by powerful funders, such as, for instance, Plan S, uh, actually do not end up affecting or uh, supporting um, uh, research fields which are less dependent on this source of funding. The field of study in that sense obviously matters enormously. The methods which are used also matter enormously. How we interpret the irreproducibility is itself hugely variable. And again, there's been a lot of work in philosophy of science looking at this notion. I think I'm sure we're going to come back to this um, during the seminar. Uh, which materials researchers have access to or not uh, makes a big difference too here. What are the target objects of researchers? Again, make a difference, especially when the target objects actually are ones which are highly commercially uh, valuable and therefore attract a different kind of um, sponsors and a different kind of constraints from um, target objects that don't have the same uh, commercial potential. And obviously there's huge implications in terms of the career stage and power dynamics within different fields, different types of seniority in different locations. And that brings me of course to one obviously recognized source of diversity, which is the characteristics of the actual researchers, their gender, their class, their ethnicity, and how this influences their ability of picking up on open science. This was, of course, a very broad overview, uh, partly because, of course, the time is very limited, and I'm very happy to come back to any of these points in discussion and in more detail. Generally, uh, I want to really conceptualize um, the idea of open science itself as not so much a system of policy and guidelines and even values that need to be implemented somehow, but as a platform to try and instigate a critical, informed and inclusive debates around these proposed ideals and reforms so that we can create something which is um, as diverse as possible and taking account of implementation. In fact, putting the question of implementation at the very center of how we conceptualize open science in the first place. And this is very much how uh, many people in my field and adjacent fields are trying to think about these questions. I'm going to leave it at that so that um, we don't run out of time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sabina, for that uh, overview. Uh, we do have a time for a question. If others want to uh, interject one, I will uh, prompt one while others are typing, if they are furiously typing. Uh, and that is the you gave that overview of global scope, systemic reach, local implementation. 
And I'm wondering to what extent you perceive some of the worries that researchers articulated as being a function in part of the stakeholders presenting this as a global transformation, right? how data sharing has to be implemented all or none uh, versus what sounded like what you were saying in the subsequent comments is a real incremental approach. There are lots of different issues and the way those issues play out will vary by person, by local context. And any effective implementation will have to embrace that. I just wonder if you could comment on that uh, for this. Thank you very much, Brian. I think actually part of the problem may well be the very idea that this is a reform. So the very idea that this is something innovative that is being launched from up high as a top-down shift and that what we need to do is bring this down to scientific practices. I mean, what we're seeing from the history of science is absolutely this is not the case. Openness has appeared in many different guises and forms across different domains since centuries. And in fact, uh, the closure of science, the kind of trouble I mentioned in the beginning very briefly of, of, of my discussion, are very often relatively recent developments of the last 50, 60 years of the scientific system that has gotten professionalized in a very particular way, particularly in the Western world. So this is very important as a starting point, I think, because it counters this idea that what we're having here is a set of ideas that uh, some uh, you know, enlightened people in research and some politicians have decided to embrace for all sorts of different reasons, and now have to be brought little by little to uh, the, daily, the, the daily practices of researchers. I think what we're having is a much more complex landscape where many researchers have been trying to implement some of these ideas in their own way and uh, assign meaning to these ideas as a uh, you know, as uh, significant to their own practices and to their own methods within their domains. But I found that there have been um, many constraints in how one could imagine and implement um, some of these ideas. And the problem at this point is that um, many of the policies that have been implemented in open science, which are incredibly well intentioned, many of them, I would say, are now appearing as a top-down incentive. And, and this is partly also because they're trying to push the system as fast as possible towards a change in direction. Now, this is all understandable and potentially even positive, but that I think is what is generating this uh, backlash of thinking, first of all, oh, is this actually gonna be some sort of top-down universalistic, universalistic approach? And also to which extent are these what now look like very top-down rules take account of all the ongoing efforts in all these different domains to try and counter um, some of the worries that in fact are um, what these reforms are trying to tackle. So in that sense, I think the incrementality of debates and consultations around this is absolutely essential. The, the role of social, scholarly societies is really, really essential. Uh, trying to involve early career researchers is very essential uh, because uh, otherwise, we're going to end up in a situation where open science becomes yet another set of bureaucratic infrastructures that researchers have to um, deal with, really. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we are short on time, but I'll ask you one more just because so many have come in uh, and then we can return to others later. So your, your 30 second response to Elizabeth Julie Vargo asking, uh, institutions are by definition characterized by rigidity and aver aversion to change. How can we envision the establishment of a rapport between institutions and open science, which can be seen as significantly more fluid and diverse? Huge question. I think that's a key question. And um, one of the things that I actually keep seeing to some extent lacking, both from theoretical, but also practical discussion of open science is uh, sometimes the roles of research performing institutions. And it's quite interesting to me that there's a lot of uh, emphasis on the publishing um, the publishing domain, the role of societies, um, uh, government policies, but in fact, uh, potentially both the biggest um, harbinger of change and also the uh, institution that's most resistant to change are universities and other research performing institutions. Now, how does one bridge that? I mean, of course, there are organizations that bring together groups of universities and are trying to do a lot of work uh, in this direction. But I think this is where uh, lobbying and insistence and work with management by uh, many people um, who are working for research performing institutions, particularly people who are at a senior level and able to affect a little bit of change sometimes <laughs> uh, on the ways in which institutions are managed and what they pay attention to is really, really important. I mean, the other thing, um, you know, it's very difficult to give a 
broad answer to this question. But the other thing is keep noting the fact that what we're talking about here are not some sort of high up ideals, but are ways to do reliable, effective, uh, socially relevant science. And also ways of actually coping with a huge digital transformation that is at the background uh, for some of the uh, open science um, reforms. And in fact, some people would identify with open science almost the idea that we're trying to respond to the shift in practices that comes from digitalization rather than from uh, the trouble that science is experiencing. So I think trying to always um, make institutions aware that these are uh, intertwined issues that cannot really be separated uh, is potentially one way to affect a little bit of change and convince a few people that this is an important thing to think about. Excellent. Thank you, Sabina, for that wonderful presentation and, and brief Q&A. Uh, we will move on to our next uh, presentation. And after this one and its short Q&A, we'll have a five minute break so that everybody can reset and not look at their screen for a few minutes. Uh, next is David Peterson. Uh, David is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Soci Sociology at UCLA. David, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, let me see if I get this set up. All right, uh, thanks so much um, everyone for showing up today. Uh, thank you for Brian for setting this up and, and uh, Claire for uh, having this all work. Um, the talk I'm giving today is called uh, Metascience as a Scientific Social Movement. And the impetus for this came a couple of years ago when I was uh, presenting some early work from my postdoc at the 4S conference in New Orleans, um, which is the Society for the Social Studies of Science. And a couple of um, weeks before this conference, somebody sent me an email, which was a link to uh, the Metascience 2019 Symposium. Um, and one of the things that struck me uh, right away was that there was virtually no communication between these two fields. And it was clear that what was happening at Stanford was much more than simply an academic field. It really sought to transform science, I think, in a basic way. Now, um, Oops, we lost him, didn't we? Uh, well, we maybe we'll take our five minute break now if he doesn't uh, reappear instantly. Uh, or we can pretend that we know what he was going to say and start to present it for him here, which I don't think is likely. Uh, so take a moment, take a break. Uh, we will recover that time uh, and skip having a break after that. Uh, if you want to walk away, uh, I will start shouting uh, when he's back uh, so that you can come back to your computer. Claire, you can even put up the uh, break sign uh, and we will work it out with David. Hello, Brian. Hi, David. You're hey. back. Great. So <laughs> we, uh, we improvised, yeah. okay. uh, gave it, giving everybody a break, and we'll just restart you again in like okay. three minutes. We'll haul yeah. Sorry about that. My uh, yeah, my uh, computer started updating and, and things started shutting down. So uh, <laughs> we'll hopefully, be, such, be ready. And, such yeah. things happen. So I, I'm going to start hollering in about three sure. minutes. Um, okay. Yes. We'll start okay, you so, thank afresh. You. Okay. 
Okay, we will begin again. Uh, if you haven't read the book Recursion yet, it's a, a new fiction book, I highly recommend it. Uh, and you will experience something just like this, where you think something happened, and it seems like it already happened that way, but it didn't actually happen. Uh, so now we are going to have David Peterson give his presentation. Uh, he's a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Sociology at UCLA. David. All right, sorry about that. And hopefully um, this will work out this time. All right. Um, so uh, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, these two conferences were going on at the same time. It was clear that something very different was happening at the Metascience uh, Symposium, a real scientific movement that was designed to change science at a fundamental level, I think. And um, I think in order to understand uh, what was happening at Metascience and what has been happening in the last couple of years, uh, you can't avoid this, uh, this discussion of the replication crisis. And um, I just found out actually that uh, the, the first time a replication crisis was used in the published literature was actually um, a 2014 piece in Nature uh, by Jonathan Schooler entitled Metascience Could Rep um, Rescue the Replication Crisis. Um, so I think Metascience and the Replication Crisis were really born together in a, in a, uh, in a kind of, um, uh, you know, a very, uh, you know, tied together way. And I think what was specific um, is the uh, particular way that meta scientists landed on a particular diagnosis for uh, for the replication crisis. Specifically, they had this um, you know psychological, sociological, and philosophical view of what was happening. Psychologically, um, there was this view of scientists as essentially uh, biased characters, right? This is a behavioral economics perspective of um, of the scientists, right? We're we're all in, you know. Uh, invariably biased, um, and the scientist is no exception. And if you let that go, it's going to run amok in the system. Uh, sociologically, there's this view of, um, you know, rather than a kind of Wartonian system where scientists primarily uh, respond to norms, there was this view that scientists respond to incentives, that uh, scientists are incentive followers, and that, uh, again, if you have, you know, a poor a, a system of incentives, it is going to show up in problems, um, you know, downstream in the system. And lastly, you have this philosophical view, which uh, looks at truth not as a um, as a uh, you know quality of an individual study or an individual uh, finding or paper, but as something that emerges uh, in a statistical sense through um, through you know the collection of of ever growing sets of data. And this diagnosis leads directly to a set of uh, ideas for the cure which is that if scientists are biased, what we need to do is we need to incentivize greater transparency and accountability in order to uh, restrain those biases. If, um, if you know, um, scientists respond to incentives, what we need to do is we need to incentivize healthy practices. So we need to incentivize replications, we need to incentivize posting data. And if the uh, truth emerges not in individual papers, but in these aggregates, then we need to develop the infrastructure to uh, actually you know, enable data hosting and aggregation. We need to, uh, you know, enable the uh, infrastructure of the future. But as a sociologist, uh, it's important to note that, you know, we don't view crises as objective phenomena, right? There are lots of problems out there, but only some of them kind of, you know, jump the moat from crisis to, uh, or, or um, from problem to crisis. And this is the result of a political and uh, cultural project um, taken on by what Howard Becker or who Howard Becker called uh, moral entrepreneurs. These are people who, um, you know, take problems and, uh, you know, gather other people's attention to them, right? The media, they, they gather, um, they gather uh, you know, important stakeholders and they make problems seem acute and urgent in order to, you know, try to solve them. And this, I think, is really what meta science, um, what meta scientists did, which is why um, we ended up adopting this, this framework of the scientific intellectual social movement. And this is a, um, a framework adopted from a couple of sociologists who were looking at uh, how social movements occurred within the context of the scientific and academic infrastructure. And the pieces of the sim to them um, were uh, uh, situations where you had high status actors who diagnose problems, uh, frame solutions, um, foster a common identity and attract resources that allow the group to perpetuate. And so um, an example that we use in the paper, um, uh, we, um, we uh, talk about cognitive uh, science. And in cognitive science, um, you had this scenario where you had this kind of dominant behaviorist paradigm, and then you had um, you had you know a bunch of uh, you know well placed uh, academics starting to diagnose problems, starting to frame solutions, and this kind of um, cognitivism, and then attracting resources. Um, actually, some of the same uh, 
uh, from some of the same funders who would later fund uh, MetaScience. And so I think all of these things uh, fit really neatly into, into MetaScience. I think MetaScience is very clearly a SIM in the sense, uh, but MetaScience is also an unusual SIM in some interesting ways. Um, one is that uh, where something like cognitive science is interdisciplinary, where uh, it is, you know, uh, represents the intersection between, um, say, linguistics and psychology, uh, MetaScience is truly transdisciplinary, right? Ultimately, they are not concerned with um, any, you know, specific content of science. They're not concerned with a particular fact or theory. They are really focused on the form of science, right? How science is uh, produced, how it is uh, stored, how it is shared, how it's communicated, how it's evaluated. And ultimately this puts it in a position of judgment relative to the other sciences because the kind of workaday practices that are happening in every other science are the object of study for the meta-scientist which I think in turn um, leads to an interesting um, ability for meta-science to kind of straddle this academic policy border, which I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, terrific, very interesting academic work, but at the same time, like at the meta-science symposium, there were a lot of funders that were there that weren't interested in this as an academic field. Their ultimate goal was, you know, how do we bring this knowledge? How do we utilize this knowledge and, and filter it back into our decision-making apparatus? Um, and so I, I think uh, this, this, you know, straddling uh, issue uh, represents both, um, you know, some, you know, promise. It's, you know, good to have this back and forth, but also some potential issues, which um, I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, so although the emergence of this uh, social movement, I think, is relatively new, we can trace it back about 10 years, it is the outcome of some, um, the intermingling of some long existing trends. And I think understanding these roots explains how, you know, despite the kind of ambitions of meta science, uh, it ultimately emerges um, so far from a, from a a fairly narrow spectrum of, um, of uh, academia. And specifically, I think um, when you look at the birth of meta-science and you look at its constitution, um, I think you can find three sort of uh, independent groups, uh, open science activists, um, scientists of science, and uh, methodological and statistical critics. And so um, each of these, I think, sort of uh, found some, some uh, new um, engagement and found some new purpose uh, in both the replication crisis and in their mutual engagement with each other. For as far as the open science uh, activists go, um, before there was open science activism, there was uh, open access, which was a movement of librarians seeking to democratize knowledge. And I think what the replication crisis did, and especially the idea of open data as a way to um, help legitimize science and help uh, protect against, you know, against frauds and cheats and you know, bad science and just enable data reuse, it enabled them to kind of expand this, this a definition of openness and, uh, um, and you know, start to colonize some new roles. Um, as Oya Reiger, who is a Cornell librarian and was the former head of archive told me, um, I think librarians are feeling like their role in discovery is really weakening. They are trying to transition their workforce and just uh, to assume new roles. And I think you know, the, the open data infrastructures uh, really provided them to, um, uh, a way for them to utilize existing skills in archiving uh, into you know, uh, this new movement. Secondly, we have the science of science. Um, and uh, this is an old, it, an old field that goes back to the, the early work of Derek Sola Price. Um, where you do you know, quantitative studies of science. But in the last decade, uh, a couple of changes have really, uh, have really transformed this field. One is you have this mass migration of everything online. And so suddenly the ability to do science of science you know, explodes and, and, and you have this possibility of, of you know, utilizing big data. And with that, you have this influx of uh, physicists and computational biologists and people with these you know, particular quantitative skills uh, into this area. And I think you know, perhaps, um, you know, perhaps uh, reflective of this of this influx is you have this new willingness not to uh, treat the science of science as an observational science, but to increasingly you know experiment and intervene on science itself. Uh, as a Fortunato at all right, engaging in in, in um, a tighter partnerships with experimentalists, the science of science will be able to better identify associations discovered from models and large scale data that have causal force uh, to enrich their policy re relevance. So there we go. So, you know, tighter partnership experimentalist for the direct purpose of having that information uh, go directly back to policy. And lastly, you have uh, this tradition of methodological and statistical criticism, which goes, you know, all the way back to, you know, when people started experimenting and, and using statistics. Um, and I think a lot of the, you know, the present discussions, you can go back to the work of someone like Paul Meal and see, you know, a lot of very prescient, uh, you know, 
uh, prescient discussions, you know, up from that work in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but this was, you know, kind of a staid, like, you know, a, a almost musty field. As uh, Fiona Fiddler, um, one of the uh, presenters at Metascience, uh, said, when I finished, um, she talked about her, her dissertation, in which she compared, um, in which she compared uh, methodological and, and uh, statistical debates in a couple fields. Um, she said, when she finished, I thought, this is going nowhere. I've just documented five, six decades of this going exactly precisely nowhere. There's nothing left for me here. Turns out I was wrong about that. It was going somewhere. And now we're all here in the middle of some kind of revolution. And so the replication crisis, I think, really gave sort of new fire, new motivation to these old arguments. And, um, and together, I think, really, um, it allowed these groups to, um, to uh, organize and to intersect in ways that were mutually beneficial. So for something like open science, you know, they, they were, you know, people in open science are, are still interested in issues like lower costs, which may not be of interest to the science of science, but both groups are interested in data reuse, right? And these areas of overlap, data reuse, research integrity, and diagnostic analysis, I think really represent the kind of core hub, which has managed to bring these diverse threads and weave them together into, into a force. Now, there have been a lot of um, you know, debates about individual findings and a lot of you know, self-flagellation you know, uh, self and, and you know, periods of anxiety in different fields. Um, and a lot of times they kind of rise and they, and they generate a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, heat and a lot of you know, uh, articles and they kind of disappear. Metascience, I think, uh, is doing something really different, which I think um, makes it important for the future of science and for people who are interested in the future of science policy, because they have been um, much more aggressive, I would say, um, at the institutionalization side of, of putting together uh, institutions and programs that are going to outlast this particular, um, you know, these particular debates. And to some degree, this has to do with the role of funders. Um, as Bruce Fetzer, who uh, is the president of the Fetzer Foundation, uh, who helped um, uh, fund uh, the Metascience Symposium. He said the idea, Metascience, was powerful enough and its time had come to where a private foundation stepped up and provided the seed capital. So you had foundations probably putting up a collective of 20, 30 million. And then all of a sudden, this thing got a huge amount of visibility because the universities got involved. And so you have this situation where the Arnold Ventures and the you know, uh, Sloan Foundation, Moore Foundation, Wellcome Trust, all of these people putting money in. Um, and I think this coincides with this uh, very interesting shift from, uh, from a rhetoric of crisis to a one of, of efficiency. As I mentioned, you know, um, uh, Jonathan Schooler, who, who wrote this, you know, Metascience Could Rescue the Replication Crisis. Uh, well, um, when I interviewed him later, I asked him, you know, is there a replication crisis? Is science or psychology in a replication crisis? And he said, quote, the word crisis is probably overblown. And I think in general, you see this a lot in, in, in both the interviews and in, um, in the, uh, the actual, you know, uh, metascientific literature is although it's very clear that you know, the raison d'etre of, of uh, metascience was the replication crisis, um, you don't see a lot of discussions of crisis in the literature. Instead, you see much more, um, you know, many more discussions of efficiency. Um, I'm not going to read all these quotes, but these are, uh, these are a bunch of passages from, um, from a pretty well-known and well-cited um, uh, metascience articles. And um, you see just a lot of discussion about you know, threats to efficiency, you know, reducing efficiency, more efficiency. Um, and I think this is part of a, a kind of a savvy move that occurs. Um, as as uh, Becker notes, uh, moral entrepreneurs often find themselves out of a job because once new policies are passed, once new laws are passed, you know, the, the purpose for um, uh, those kind of moral entrepreneurs goes away. But, you know, crises fade, but the, uh, this idea of making science more efficient, of efficiency, is forever. And so I think um, you know, shifting into this new role has been a way for uh, metascience to cement a kind of longer lasting influence in science. So uh, I've got a, about a minute and a half, and so I just want to bring up a couple points about why this matters. Um, so I think this matters for a couple of reasons. One, uh, I think metascience has largely been framed uh, as a movement for scientists by scientists. And I think that's largely true. I think there's a lot of well-meaning people in here that are you know, trying to do good work. Um, but I think it is uh, naive to uh, not appreciate the fact that a lot of the products of science, uh, they end up, um, uh, these kind of methods to observe and to um, you know, intervene in science directly, they represent um, something that the managers of science, people in the institutions and funding world have long wanted, which is you know, more insight and more control over what happens in, in, in science which is one of the reasons why I think, as, um, as Sabina brought up in the last talk, that there is a sense that this represents a kind of bureaucratic um, uh, uh, you know, um, creep, 
right? A, a sort of sense that that uh, that they're having to do more and more things that maybe they don't understand or don't appreciate. And uh, as a separate pro a project from this, um, we interviewed a bunch of workaday scientists, and this was a lot of people, you know, um, gave us different flavors of this. There was a sense of like we are, you know, getting more and more demands on our time in the name of these, you know, uh, you know, transparency and openness and. Uh, you know, and and um, you know, making science more legitimate initiatives, but they didn't necessarily, you know, um, directly see see the value for it themselves, and it, it felt more like an imposition. And uh, lastly, um, I think there are big questions as to how much meta science really implies a kind of singular, coherent science. Even in this conversation we've been having today, there's been a lot of focus on on psychology because I think this is where a lot of the movement comes from. But I think there are there are real reasons to doubt, and I'm just going to plug a, another paper that. Um, that uh, Aaron Panofsky, who, who also wrote this paper with me, um, and I, uh, I recently published, um, there's this article where we uh, argue that that different replication cultures in these different sciences ends up producing uh, very different, um, you know, very different modes of self-correction. And I think without understanding that, uh, you know, meta scientists and other you know replication activists within science are at real risk of pushing, um, uh, of pushing policies that uh, are. Um, ill-suited to the specific and you know experimental and epistemic environment. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and stop. Excellent. Thank you very much, David, for that presentation. It generated a lot of comments in both the chat and Q and A. So I'll uh, present a couple, and then there'll be time, hopefully, at the end for getting back to some of the others. Uh, one from Steve Goodman, uh, who asks, one of the big problems of meta-science is that while it purports to transcend science and scientific fields, in fact, most meta-scientists are completely constrained by their home disciplines. Much of what has been going on in psychology and the social sciences was what clinical research went through in the 1980s to present, as represented by the mass movement triggered by the Cochrane collaboration and resulting in the largest pre-registration platform yet created, supported by law, clinicaltrials.gov. How can we analyze meta-science without seeing that it has existed and evolved very differently and at different times in different fields? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's the uh, major question that I think that uh, that I have been struggling with, and I think this kind of um, this kind of critical uh, you know critical analysis of meta-science has been struggling with. I think so. I my dissertation research started in psychology labs. And so I was doing observations of, of practices in psychology labs when a lot of the kind of replication um, debates emerged within those fields. And then I saw something really interesting, which was this kind of transition from a lot of the people who were who were you know interested in these questions of psychology. They suddenly transitioned to this larger you know meta science that you know these you know since um, since the conditions that created the problems in psychology are not unique to psychology. Uh, then you know we can start to address science more broadly, and so there was this uh, there was this generalization that happened, and I think in that generalization there is a real danger, because I think when you do, um, and I think again this goes back to Sabina's point that when you do go back and actually talk to individual scientists in different fields, you find out that that you know even though the fields may in a superficial sense look similar, that in fact they're dealing with very different sets of challenges, and that the same policies that may work very effectively in one field may not make sense at all in another. Um, as, as a part of the, uh, the paper that I, um, uh, that I just mentioned um, that, uh, that just got published in the Social Studies of Science, um, there, uh, there are very different um, like policies of self-correction. And this idea of, um, of, of what I've been talking about before, this, this myth of self-correction, I think that may be true in some fields. There may you know, be some serious, serious problems with uh, uh, self-correction mechanisms in certain fields. But I think you don't know that until you actually go in and see how these self-correction uh, uh, correction mechanisms work uh, in different environments. And then, you know, until you do that, I, I think um, it's very risky to start to start assuming that um, that you know what works or doesn't work in one field can be applied to others. Great, thank you. And and for time, I'll probably ask you one more and maybe two if we can squeeze it in. Uh, but there are a number of questions about efficiency. One here from Bart Penders. Efficiency has no upper bound, and its pure pursuit brings along the risk of endless pressure, similar to excellence. How to dodge that as a structural problem? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a, an interesting point here, and I think this is one of the the um, the questions. I think if meta science wants to uh, found itself on efficiency, if that if, if that's the, um, the the rock it wants to 
found itself on. I think that is a not a solid foundation. I think the idea of efficiency in science, I don't think makes um, makes sense at a philosophical level because I think the idea of efficiency essentially um, it requires a, a scenario where you have a known end and you you rearrange the means to achieve that known end. The problem with um, with basic science is, is you don't know what that known end is, right? I mean, you go back to people like Popper and Polanyi, these classical uh, these classical uh, philosophers of science, and it is a it is a, a fundamental characteristic of basic science for them that it can't be directed. That ultimately we don't know where it's going, which means that uh, that you know since, since we don't know where it's going, uh, we we can't efficiently organize the means to to get there, right? And so um, what? The risk, I think, the danger is that instead of you know using the actual ends of science, which is which you often don't know like what progress is until you know until many years down the road, you end up um, substituting countable things, right? You end up you know substituting uh, citation counts or you know some other proxy. And as soon as you do that, then you then you introduce all of the problems with gamifying. Then you have you know scientists rather than actually trying to produce you know in a qualitative sense for other people in their in their you know expert community you have them starting to um, starting to react to this external system which is going to um, you know determine their career a career uh, trajectory and so I, I think you already see this somewhat with things like performance metrics um, in in science and I think there is a danger uh, that efficiency um, you know uh, in science becomes a kind of similar cudgel. Great, thank you for that, David. In the interest of time, we will move on to the next uh, presenter. Uh, David and others, feel free to engage uh, the other questions uh, in the chats, uh, and we can return to some of them uh, in the closing discussion. Uh, our fourth presenter is Bernard de Vezer. She is an associate professor of marketing at the College of Business and Economics at the University of Idaho. Berna, thanks very much for joining us. Hi, everyone. Um, so um, other speakers have covered a lot of ground with regard to epistemological, cultural, and social aspects of the reform movement. I'll specifically focus on the methodological practices, which I will refer to as metamethodology. Um, to quickly summarize my key critique, I'll quote a paragraph I just came across um, in a book I was reading and thought perfectly captured the gist of my position. This is, um, it's a book. Um, it's from a well-known book called Probability Theory, the Logic of Science by E.T. James, and this quote jumped at me right in the preface. In the, old net, um, in the old works, there was a strong tendency to argue on the level of philosophy or ideology. We can now hold ourselves somewhat aloof from this because thanks to recent work, there's no need to appeal to such arguments. We're now in possession of proven theorems and masses of worked out numerical examples. One can argue with a philosophy, it's not so easy to argue with. Independently of all of your philosophy, here are the facts of actual performance. So in metal methods with literature, we largely lack such proven theorems and worked out numerical or computational examples. And we customarily rely on verbal argumentation and assertions instead of established statistical facts. Let me give you some examples of common methodological assertions often communicated in this literature. For this talk, I just picked a few related to reproducibility, which I will use interchangeably with replicability, so it's results reproducibility. For example, the goal of science is to maximize replicability, so we should strive to improve replicability or um, reproducibility of results. Replication is the way to separate true findings from false positives, so if we suspect something is a false finding, we should simply try and replicate it to get conclusive answers. Relatedly, a third one is that true results should, always, um, should be almost perfectly reproducible, barring sampling error. So these assertions are sometimes implied and sometimes explicitly stated, and all seem harmless and plausible enough, but how do we know they're true? Do we, do we have enough evidence to justify the um, commoditization of such assertions? Science reform kind of is, uh, the literature is brimming with similar assertions on many methodological issues um, and certain problematic patterns arise, um, such as vague, incomplete or misleading assertions at times as slogans being presented as unconditional bold facts about scientific practice, unestablished or untested methodological innovations getting rushed as solutions to sometimes ill-defined problems, 
policy implementation preceding a true understanding of complex problems of scientific nature and hidden unstated assumptions lurking in the background, obscuring when and why methodological assertions should hold. All of these demonstrate a lack of transparency, precision, and formal rigor. So assuming that transparency is a shared value upheld in the reform movement, we need to think carefully about methodological transparency as well. And it requires that we shift the current assertion-based discourse and move away from arguments uh, from authority and arguments from popularity. Instead, we need to normalize and prioritize pro proper formal methodology. Here we offer a um, neat five-step process to satisfy the minimum standards for statistical rigor and to facilitate nuanced, measured, well-supported um, assertions. So step one is to conceptualize a methodological idea. And this is something that we already see a lot. Um, formalism, though, starts at step one with clear statement of mathematical assumptions and definitions of our variables, parameters, constants. At step two, we formalize our conceptual idea using the terms we defined and under specific assumptions that we made. And at step three, we apply probability theory and derive formal results with proof. Step four, now we can demonstrate numerical examples or computational examples to solidify these facts and extend them to different situations. Only then should we start thinking about issuing recommendations and policy. Um, oftentimes in reform movement, what we see is a jump from step zero to step five. My collaborators and I um, have tried to address this gap to study issues surrounding reproducibility formally. And we have aimed to achieve clarity in the foundational concept for meta science from the get go. For instance, to properly formalize reproducible to related problems, we first need to clearly identify what is the focal object of meta science, um, precisely define what a replication study is, and examine what factors contribute to failure to replicate systematically. To that end, we introduced the notion of idealized study as a useful tool. We basically break down an empirical study, experimental or otherwise, into its core components to systematically and formally examine their relationship. The focal object of current meta science discourse is an empirical study, which we idealize and demarcate with psi, and it consists of a number of interacting components. M is the model under which we make inference. Theta represents the, some unknown components of the model about which we would like to make inference. Um, X sub N represents data from a random sample of type N that's generated under a true model, an assumed true model. S represents our experimental and statistical methods, so it covers both design and analysis related issues. Um, K is the totality of the background knowledge we bring in to this study. And finally, there's D, which represents decision rules we introduce externally, such as the significance level. So this is not empty notation. Statistically speaking, we know how these elements behave, what role they play in generating empirical results, and issuing theoretical guarantees. Now that we know exactly what we mean by an empirical study, we can also define a replication study. Um, an ICE replication study is a study that's exactly the same as XI um, in all that two components. It only differs in X sub N because we need a new independent sample, um, independent random sample. And K is different because we need knowledge of the original study that's added to the other background knowledge that we bring in. So these core concepts, we then can apply probability and did apply probability theory to derive theoretical results related to when we call a result to successfully reproduce, what reproducibility rate is in um, general, how it's related to truth, and then use computer simulations to study how different components of the experiment or the study behave and interact with each other. So I'm going to show you some example sample simulation results we obtained that bring some nuance to the assertions that I listed earlier. First one, should science subjectivize improving reproducibility? In a 2019 paper, we created a simulated scientific universe 
in which agents run studies on their different strategy and look at different outcomes of the scientific process. In this plot, the colored dots represent different research strategies. Um, X-axis shows the speed of true discovery and Y-axis shows the reproducibility rate as experienced by the scientific community. Um, the first thing that we see here, um, here is the kind of semi-haphazard spread of dots all around the map. Um, and the second is the effect of clear effect of research strategies. We find that some research strategies, such as the ones represented here in blue, um, will make true discoveries very quickly, but the, they're going to be all over the place with regards to reproducible traits. Whereas others, such as the red research strategy, will reach maximum levels of reproducibility while not being able to guarantee that a true discovery will be made in a reasonable amount of time. It's the minimum this result suggests that prioritizing reproducibility improving strategies um, may have undesirable consequences for scientific progress under certain assumptions. Second one, can we use replications to tell true results apart from false ones? For that, I'll show you um, another simulation from a recent result, recent paper that we published. Imagine we study a research question about the effect of um, a single predictor on a dependent variable in a simple linear regression framework. However, imagine that there's a problem with the instrument we use. So um, to measure the predictors such that it adds noise. But we don't know that, so we fit a standard simple linear reg regression model without accounting for measurement error. Um, so basically, we're making inference on their um, model misspecification. Every square on this map uh, summarizes the results of 1 million regression models um, with um, other model misspecification based on independent samples. On the x-axis, we have um, a ratio of measurement error variability to sampling error variability. The larger this ratio, the greater the relative effects of measurement error on our on observed data. And y-axis shows the distance of our estimated effect from the true effect. The closer we are to the origin, the, uh, the more we go, we go down here, the closer we are to discovering a true effect. And the heat map, shows the rate of reproducibility. The darker the color, the higher the rate of reproducibility for a given result. So the black ones are 100% reproduced results and white ones are zero reproducibility. You can see that for different weights of measurement error. So as you go around the x-axis, um, we can achieve high reproducibility for results at varying distances from, from truth. We can be nowhere close to truth. We can be up here um, on top of this map and still find a way to replicate our results perfectly. Um, and finally, let me show you another result. Um, are, are true results re reproducible? In other words, is reproducibility primarily a function of the state of truth? So here's a new simulation example from a working paper. We have a Another linear regression example where the true effect size is small. X-axis shows the accumulation of replication studies, so zero the, uh, the original study here and the um, 300 replication study at the end of the map um, through time. And Y-axis shows the reproducibility rate again. In this one, we're making inference under the true model, so no model misspecification. We look at two different statistical methods. Uh, method one and method two to analyze our data. And we also simulate different sample sizes, small and large. Each simulation ends up converging on a value that's represented by a star. And the, by theoretical proof, we know that this, is the, this represents the true rate of reproducibility for that particular result. Um, Quasi-replications -replic correspond to simulations in which the replication study is in some way different from the original study. Um, so from this plot, we can quickly observe a few things. First one, that not all true results are equally reproducible. For example, the true reproducible rate of a um, true result from a study based on small sample size, um, the, the blue and the orange ones here, 
uh, they converge to a true reproducible rate of 40% um, in, in this particular simulation. Even when true reproducible rate is high, so looking at the purple and the green um, cases here, we might see a lot of variation in the observed reproducibility after only a small number of replications. So between zero and 50, you're gonna see a lot of variation in the reproducible traits that we observe. Um, reproducible rate then is also a, um, is a function of not only the truth, but also our design and analysis choices. All of these simulations that I showed you, and, and there's a lot more in the papers, um, um, are backed up by and exemplify theoretical results on their clearly stated assumptions. And they show that there's a lot of nuance um, to be added to methodological assertions. And without this level of specificity, common assertions we hear are at the minimum um, overgeneralizations. But worse yet, they can be misleading and might have major consequences down the line that um, may be undesirable for science. In general, in current meta methods split narratives, we see certain patterns. For example, science reform has so far prioritized sample size related issues over sampling related issues, p hacking and similar QRPs over model specification, restricting the use of data sets to prevent double dipping over. Uh, scrutinizing data carefully before analysis and things like selective um, inference. Replication studies over theory um, have been prioritized over theory development and transparency in empirical claims has been prioritized over transparency in methodological assertions and so on. Um, all of these are arbitrary choices that potentially represent dominant epistemology and preferences of early readers, um, leaders of the reform movement and there's not, no particular logic to these priorities, no systematic approach underlying them, and no guarantee that they're the best way to address current problems. We think there's a better way, and that better way is to shift to a new logic for meta methodology. Um, similar to the sentiment expressed by the quotes I gave you from Jane, we believe a transparent and sound meta methodology needs First, to deprioritize arbitrary goalposts, then to focus on establishing facts instead of settling for bare assertions that support clean narratives, because typically in statistics, um, there's not gonna be a lot of clean narratives. There's always gonna be some nuance to be added and some assumptions uh, that need to be specified. And to aim for higher precision, nuance, and statistical rigor as supported by probability theory. Um, that's all from me. And if you're interested in reading more, I'm going to have uh, these links in the slides that I'll share. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Berna. We do have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. If they come up, I see that there are one or two arriving. I'll ask a first one uh, of the, the five-step uh, approach that you described. Right. Where is the role or what is the role of, of exploration uh, in that? Testing ideas in the field right. to try to understand those models or assumptions and otherwise. Exploration, I think, may, I mean, since we're talking about statistical claims here, it's a little bit different from regular exploratory research where we're talking about um, phenomena. And thinking about this, I'm exploration may come up in during the conception of ideas for sure and exploration there's going to be extensive exploration i think in step four where you're actually looking for boundaries and limitations of these effects and explore um, under which circumstances your methods uh, work under which conditions they don't work how you can expand assumptions um, there's going to be extensive exploration um, after you have built the um, foundation for the um, for the method. Great, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. The another question, John Sakaluk asks: I wonder if there are any themes that have become apparent to you in terms of more effective, whatever way you want to define that, uh, combinations of methods used plus type of study or research question. Are there certain typologies that we should be emphasizing or de-emphasizing? Hmm. Typologies. So it, that's an interesting question. 
I think, um, I don't know, I don't necessarily think of, I don't necessarily mind, I think, putting different types of research into boxes, like well-specified boxes, a useful exercise on pretty much um, a, a, a pluralist myself in approach. I think we need all kinds of approaches and sometimes trying to fit them into well-specified categories is kind of um, artificial and may obscure, you know, like what we're doing. So I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that question, I think. I need to think a little bit more. That's true uh, of many questions. They are hard yeah. to answer. Uh, so one more, so we have time. Uh, could you expand, this is from an anonymous attendee. Hmm. Could you expand on what quasi-replications would mean, given oh, that yeah. it's basically impossible? Right. I'll, I'll let you respond there. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so in this case, let me just go back to the slide because I kind of you know, um, skipped through that. As, as I said, this is kind of a working paper. But what we mean here is that the um, it, it, these purple, green, blue, and um, orange cases, they all represent exact replications. So everything that I defined in the um, ID life study, other than the you know, background knowledge and the um, samples are exactly the same. Whereas in quasi-replication, so for instance, this um, initial original study could be, could be using method one and have a small sample size, whereas the replication studies will use different methods and different sample sizes. So it's gonna be different in some way from the original study in quasi-replication. So this, um, the reproducible rate that it com they converge to over time is going to be kind of an, an average of different types of methods. So it's not going to be specific to a single result. That's what I mean by that. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll see yeah, many sure. more questions that you might want to respond to in the uh, Q&A right. uh, box. So thank you, uh, Berna. We will turn thank to you. our final uh, presentation and then uh, okay. switch over to a group discussion. Our fifth presenter is Kyle Harp-Rushing. Kyle is an adjunct lecturer at Chapman University. Kyle, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I just wanted to, can you all hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Just let me know if not. Um, and I just wanted to thank uh, Brian and Claire for inviting me and putting this together. Um, it really is such a wonderful treat to be um, included on in such a, a fantastic panel, um, you know, studying um, increasingly relevant and uh, crucial topic. Um, so in, in, in early 2016, I became interested in the topic of uh, open science after coming across a series of, of tweets and sort of tweet storm about a reproducibility crisis that was brewing in the field of psychology. As a grad student in anthropology, my interests were largely in the ethnographies of science that kind of cross-pollinated with the field of science and technology studies more broadly. Um, and I'd read about the science wars of the 1990s. Um, and so this, this crisis that was kicked off by RPP seemed very uh, familiar. Um, and I think, you know, David was mentioning um, sort of getting to this as well. Um, and so many of the heated debates among the scientists echoed those of, of a previous generation, for example, about generalizability of research findings and significance of tacit knowledges that are kind of specific from lab to lab. Um, and I, I noticed there was uh, an omission, um, uh, as, as David mentioned, of um, uh, scholarship of science, science technology studies in general, um, but more specifically um, uh, subfields within STS that I think um, really lend themselves to these same, these same uh, types of questions, um, particularly feminist anthropological approaches to science um, that are grounded in um, uh, from Nancy Hartsock and Sandra Harding um, standpoint um, and really taking seriously the subjectivity of uh, the researcher. Um, and so Jane Morosky, um, a, a, a historian of psychology has talked about with relatively few exceptions, um, psychology has uh, tended to, um, uh, has tended to um, not quite integrate reflexivity in the same way um, into uh, 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 their interpretation and analysis of results. Um, so 
And, and I forgot to set my timer. So Claire, if you could just send me that that nudge um, once I you know start to get a couple minutes to the end. Um, but so as it turned out, I was also working on it as a graduate student researcher on a project that involved the very same agency that had coordinated RPP. Um, I got invited to visit COS and was enchanted by really what immediately felt like a, a sense of what Durkheim called collective effervescence, this sort of electrified atmosphere that really seemed to infuse into the space. You know, it, it permeated this cool kind of decentralized um, porous open office, but it also really um, animated the, the extremely generous and welcoming um, employees that work there. And so, so I asked if I could be allowed maybe to conduct anthropological research there. And I'll never forget Brian's response that we wouldn't really be open if we said no, right? <laughs> um, so from 2016 to 2018, I spent about three months at the center, uh, which um, is not really, uh, admittedly not a lot of time for a properly ethnographic research project, um, but you know, um, untreated and really, um, uh, crushing social anxiety and depression were kind of really impinging on my ability to do that kind of long-term immersion um, that's generally expected. So when I wasn't there, I also tried to keep in communication with, um, with the friendships, with the friends that I had made there. And so that friendship really um, kind of influenced the direction I wanted to take when I was writing up my dissertation. Um, I was influenced also largely by the commitments to friendship and hospitality in general that I was really fortunate to experience. Um, and so I started to uh, try to, to question, how can we think of open science as a question of social reproduction and reproducibility, right? So really, how do we create these alternative knowledge ecologies and infrastructures that you know, genuinely invite and welcome folks um, and that organize and promote uh, relationality and, and, and sort of intellectual solidarity amongst folks, rather than you know, continuing to resort to these rebranded kind of simplistic uh, suites of heuristics for you know, research quality or impact or productivity or things like that. And so I'm very much in debt to Marxist feminist scholars um, that followed uh, uh, you know, um, like Nancy Hartsock and Sandra Harding, um, like Kylie Jarrett um, and Jody Dean, who productively um, have been interrogating the ways in which emerging information and media um, ecologies enable corporations to exploit really not only um, necessarily our labor anymore, but uh, the very substance of our relationality as such. So that's our, our means of communication. For example, Jody Dean uh, describes this particular moment in the monstrous transmogrification of late capitalism. Um, in 2014, she talked about um, uh, our collective passage into what she calls communicative capitalism, where, quote, values heralded as central to democracy materialize in networked communication technologies. Ideals of access, inclusion, discussion, and participation are realized through expansions, intensifications, and interconnections of global uh, telecommunications. So although Dean and Jarrett are really kind of focusing on, on social media, um, Jarrett in uh, her fantastic book, The Digital Housewife, um, which of course is different in many ways from the open science information ecology. Um, I kind of want to propose that the, the problem or difficulties that this opens up for, for downstream consequences um, for open science is in many ways similar. So despite the techno-utopian promise that, you know, uh, amongst some uh, uh, corporations, social media would facilitate um, something akin to class consciousness among an otherwise disparate group of workers in the knowledge class, um, Jody Dean finds us trapped really in what she calls a setting of communication without communicability, in which the content of our utterances is, is rendered unimportant. Um, and so her goal is to understand how it is that such, quote, participatory infrastructures that are predicated on positive visions of the communicative commons really instead to come, re come to reinforce the capitalist status quo by stifling solidarity and, 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 and uh, knowledge sharing. So I recognize that the connection to open science here might feel like a bit of a stretch. Um, and so my thoughts throughout are kind of admittedly speculative, but keep in mind that we've actually already seen this in many ways. Um, and we've seen many examples of open sciences I think we can call recuperation um, or it's cynical kind of capture and, re and slick rebranding by the same extractionists 
um, extremely parasitic uh, journal publishers that many of us maybe would hope would have crumbled under open science. Um, so Philip Morawski, uh, in a recent article in 2018, and the uh, in, an issue, in the issue of social Sci um, studies of science, discusses the quote numerous hybrid formats that combine corporate control with really only a modicum of outsourcing or crowdsourcing within these open science kind of um, public private partnerships. Um, and then you couple that with the, the, the need to pivot, right? As many within and outside of the self-described open science community have already pointed out with open access, charging $40 of journal articles and extortion model the, the, whose viability is really rapidly vanishing, right? Um, so for example, anthropologist Chris Kelty, um, when Elsevier bought the, uh, the social science preprint hosting platform from um, SSN in 2016, he put it simply in a blog post that was entitled, It's the Data Stupid meaning that Elsevier's motivation wasn't merely to place thousands of uh, preprints suddenly behind a, a paywall, um, but actually, and, and really kind of more insidiously to monetize the enormous trove of data that was hidden behind those preprints um, and to monetize the data about um, researchers. And so this, this kind of reminds me of a quote from the, uh, the late cultural theorist and adjunct lecturer, um, Mark Fisher, that, that the limits of capitalism are not fixed by fiat but they're really defined and redefined pragmatically and improvisationally. And so this makes capitalism very much like the thing in John Carpenter's film of the same name. It's a monstrous, infinitely plastic entity capable of metabolizing and absorbing anything with which it comes into contact. Um, or as Marx and Engels have said, um, all that is solid melts into air, all that is sacred is profane. So returning to Jody Dean's insight that the materialization of the ideals of democracy into networked communication technologies has really coalesced into a milieu in which, quote, communication exists without communicability. And that's also dominated by an informational ecology where in which utterances gain steam regardless of their value and actually increasingly often in inverse relationship to their value, right? Um, it's, I think it's really timely that we think about what critique and particularly the critique of the critics um, uh, will look like. Um, so I'm inspired by anthropologist of science, uh, Kim Fortin's animation of Jacques Derrida's notion of the paradox of hospitality, which she applies to, um, to data sharing platforms and their kind of proliferation of late. And she, she notes that Derrida points out that the, at the heart of platform hospitality, there's a tension between the necessity to exert mastery and control over a space, right? To, to maintain a database, to, to perform that vital repair labor, for example, and an openness or a willingness to surrender that, that ownership, right? To allow participation in these in said database to be really as seamless and, and frictionless uh, an experience as possible, to borrow from Paul Edwards' work. And so this tension becomes increasingly fraught um, with, with contradictions as speed and bandwidth, um, sort of this accelerationist approach to open science become indiscriminate research targets. Um, or really simply as research productivity becomes measured in events and uploads, um, really potentially of even pretty shoddy you know, content. Um, so, and in, in some cases, pretty, pretty troubling content as well. In the concluding chapter of my dissertation, for example, I tried to examine the downstream flows of, uh, of preprints that were um, that were posted to Sci Archive, uh, the, the the psychological um, preprint archive, by individuals claiming to be psychology researchers, and one of which was downloaded, uh, which was downloaded over a thousand times. Um, Dubuisi claimed to offer support for social models of quote meritocracy and against um, quote racial discrimination models by comparing self-reported racial categories to quote cognitive ability um, or intelligence quotient, whatever that means, and income. Uh, so in at least one instance, I found the author of the preprint had generated a lot of interest on the white supremacist uh, forum Stormfront, where the original poster of a popular thread um, favorably quote, quoted and linked to an interview um, with the author, with the author um, and he cited the author as being, quote, genuinely knowledgeable and racially awakened. Um, and so, you know, to be clear, I'm not saying that the issue of myths or disinformation can be heaped on the doorstep of open science. Um, I'm really not saying that at all. Uh, it, misinformation and disinformation in science has a really um, uh, quite a long history. 
Um, the highly controversial pseudoscientific publication, for example, My Mankind Quarterly, um, which sadly for me, Google lists as an anthropology journal, has provided scientific racism with the symbolic accoutrements and imprimatur of legitimacy um, since the early 1960s. Uh, elsewhere, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway um, have really, you know, brilliantly demonstrated how teams of scientific experts with otherwise impeccable credentials have been routinely assembled to manufacture public doubt about the causes of global warming and the, the smoking uh, cat cancer link. Um, but I also don't think that the, that the problem can be neatly summarized as the result of a lack of clarity surrounding one online preprint archive submission and moderation policy. So for example, um, when I click on the link to Sherpa at the bottom, Sci Archive and directed to a generic land page, and then a search for Sci Archive turns up no results. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, moderation policies are, poor, are, are, of course, part of the issue, but, you know, for example, it's not even clear um, how a moderation policy can or, or even really should be constructed that would have prevented a preprint being posted and disseminated that was falsely interpreted to suggest that COVID-19 was deliberately manufactured in a lab. Um, which, according to BioArchive, this month alone has been downloaded uh, astonishingly to me, over 2,000 times, um, despite receiving widespread criticism and ultimately being retracted shortly after being posted in late January 2020. Um, so then the issue is um, to how much damage can still be done, uh, even for those who feel that the scientific process is working just fine because, you know, people got together on um, on Twitter and, you know, really um, took, took these authors to task for several methodological issues. Um, but I'm also not saying that the preprint well is poisoned uh, with mis and disinformation. For example, I would be surprised if we, if we come to find that preprints on the open science um, infrastructure and ecologies in general were, were really useful in speeding up the development of a, of a COVID-19 vaccine, right, that many of us um, fortunately, I've been really extremely privileged, fortunate to receive. Um, but instead, you know, I kind of, I want to think back with um, the, the sort of omissions um, uh, it, that, I, that I see in meta-science and a kind of sidelining, um, you know, as, as Sabina mentioned, of qualitative uh, research uh, about science and, and, and qualitative um, uh, studies of science and technology. Um, to begin to continue to think about um, the, 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 the substance of relationships that, that um, create uh, uh, that create knowledge and disseminate knowledge and how that can that also extends to um, uh, other infrastructures like social media. Um, and with that I'll go ahead and uh, stop it looks like I'm out of time. Um, so thank you. Perfectly timed, Kyle. Thank you very much. Uh, so a couple of questions and then we'll transition to group discussion. Uh, a first is uh, that I'll, I'll take is a, uh, the, you know, the communication without communicability phrase. I, I take that part of your comments as potentially ego deflating on the ability to trans, transition ideals effectively at all into practice? Are there, in sort of the analysis as you provided, are there productive paths uh, that are better strategies than others for manifesting those ideals? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my, uh, my sort of att attempt to animate um, uh, Dean's concept around that is to, uh, to really try to think uh, with um, uh, kind of the, these forces of like memification or contentification, right? Where um, we become really uh, so deeply immersed, in, immersed and interpolated into, um, you know, quasi participatory uh, networks of communication um, that the content that, that begins to circulate within uh, those those networks, um, you know, it, it is is reduced in value, reduced um, reduced, you know, narrative is lost, um, and we lose a, a sense of complexity, right? And so I think this is really kind of a larger kind of commentary about the um, 
you know, the, the inefficacy we've seen of, of, of organizing on social media, right? And why we continue to see um, uh, harassment, um, it, it, you know, emerging to such an extent on, on social media. And so for me, it's not productive to talk about open science um, separate and apart from social media because open science has really kind of embraced social media in a lot of ways. Um, and so in that embrace, I think it's really, you know, um, uh, so your question is like, how, I guess, how do we do better, right? Um, and th I mean, that's such a, a crucial question. And one of the things that's always um, deeply, you know, inspiring and, and what really stood out from my time at CLS is that's a, that's a question that you all are continually grappling with, right? You're, you're always continually grappling with how do we continue to, um, to make not only our infrastructures better, but the cultures around them. And so um, there are scholars, uh, Charlotte G at uh, MIT, for example, um, has a book on what might a feminist in, uh, internet look like. And I think, you know, trying to create spaces of accountability in, in ways like that, um, you know, could, could, really, could really help but also not relying on um, technological fixes to, to really, um, to, to achieve it on, a, on, a, on its own, right? So there was a comment that I saw on the, uh, over the break that I thought was really, um, was really fantastic about switching from talking about incentives to justice, right? And one of the, one of the hopes, one of the, the, you know, the imaginaries that I always um, hear that, that comes up a lot in open science discourses is, you know, uh, we no longer have to worry necessarily about data getting scooped and published from out from under us because it's time stamped, right? Um, but it makes me think about, you know, the contributions of Rosalind Franklin, for example. I don't think that her work was overlooked because she couldn't prove that she took the photographs um, that proved the helical, you know, structure of DNA, right? Her work was overlooked because even if she could, pr could have proved it, what would have happened? I mean, she probably would have been labeled aggressive, she would, would have been labeled bitchy, like all these other things, right? And so it's this larger, um, system or structure that, you know, I think the commentator, I don't recall her name now, um, really points out and differentiating between incentives and, and justice. Great. Thank you. Uh, one more question for you, and then we'll go to the whole panel. Uh, this is from Bart Penders. It might be old fashioned, but could a dramaturgical perspective help highlight the seemingly paradoxical ingredients of open science movements in which there's a backstage to the politics of erasing the backstage. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, um, you know, that's, that's really, uh, I, I hadn't thought of that, but I think that's a really, a really great question. Um, it reminds me of work um, uh, by Cheris Thompson on, on good science and the choreographies of good science. Um, um, she wrote this in this book, Good Science Choreographies of, of um, you know, trying to sort of interpret how it is um, that, uh, you know, good scientific practices, what we've come to regard as scientific practices are enacted through, through the body, right, become embodied. Um, and so in another research project that I've worked on, um, uh, you know, one of the, one of the tensions that I see, one of the barriers um, with uh, particularly graduate students and PIs adopting infrastructures for open science is, is primarily because they see it as uh, in conflict with their, um, you know, their, their subject formation, their formation of themselves as research subjects, right? Because they feel such an immense amount of pressure um, and stress to, to constantly be, you know, carrying out all these um, expectations of performing good science, right? Um, you know, housekeeping, um, Mike Fortune at, at, uh, at UCI talks about these four qualities of carrying out good science, housekeeping, friendliness. Um, and, and, um, and so thinking about it from a dramaturgical perspective, I think would be, would be really deeply fascinating. I don't know of anybody doing that work, but that's, that sounds you know, really interesting, yeah. Great, thank you, Kyle. And thank you all for your individual presentations.
Uh, what we will do now is, is encourage an open discussion among the panel members. We have some seeding questions from uh, members of the observing community, but uh, we encouraged uh, the, this group to, to talk with each other, ask each other questions and follow up. So I'll just seed with one uh, question and then we'll see what happens uh, in how they interact with each other. Uh, and this comes from Andrew Smart uh, and references back uh, to uh, David's uh, presentation, uh, but is relevant for all of viewers, I think. And that is why is efficiency a good scientific value? If anything, science only progresses through inefficiency. We learn the most from failure, refutations and mistakes. Efficiency is an economic value not a scientific one. Anybody want, David, maybe you want to start and then anybody else can react. I mean, I think efficiency is uh, is clearly a value. I don't think it's necessarily, I, I so uh, in a couple of, of weeks or months, um, uh, Aaron and I are gonna be, um, uh, there will be a piece um, out called um, Arguments Against Efficiency in Science. And um, the uh, idea is, is not necessarily that efficiency is a terrible idea but I think it is a, a terrible lodestar for science. I don't think it is necessarily um, the value that should guide all of science. Uh, I think there are a number of, of, of other values and efficiency uh, in some sense, as, as the commentator noted, can, um, can I think negatively influence the progress in science. Um, but I think you know, ultimately the goal here is to, is to weigh these different values, right? Is to think about the different values of you know, things like um, justice or insight or um, sustainability or you know, um, theoretical significance. I mean, efficiency is just one value in the system. And so I think we, you know, we do need to do a better job of, of sort of weighing these rather than um, just assuming because it is the perhaps easiest to model and the easiest to, um, to evaluate, uh, you know, just go with efficiency. Maybe I'm just going to ask, uh, add uh, quickly, I thought uh, David's reply to this question earlier also was extremely useful. And uh, I would say efficiency has a very loaded history. So I completely agree with him that this is not um, a value that comes uh, with a very, with a wide open space for interpretation. This is a value that comes and is adopted uh, very often precisely because there are very specific ways of quantifying it, which relate to um, economic models which can then, you know, or there is an expectation that this can be transferred to scientific research. And I think this is incredibly problematic on, on a vibe what I do respect. Um, and not least because it assumes that we know what successful science is. And that is a question that has come up in many of the comments in the Q&A and, and also on Twitter, like in discussing uh, this symposium, I think is really useful here to really question what success means, because that's, I mean, I take it in fact to be the key issue in open science, that there is a questioning and a reframing of what success may be in research. And that needs to happen in a way which is non-universalistic and non-generalistic and trivializing, uh, while adopting efficiency very, very often is exactly a kind of trivializing um, of basically canceling out the value of that question in the first place. Uh, if, if I may just add to that, it's, I think um, ex exactly efficiency is really tied to this kind of economic perspective on how to manage research, which is really tied to uh, funding, especially public funding. So this uh, push for efficiency and efficiency trumping other things as a value uh, is seen as um, uh, justifying the public trust in all this money being invested into research, right? So I think there is quite a bit of space in uh, the reform debates and in open science more broadly uh, for this, this talk of incentive structures, right? And radical propositions of what to do with how funding works in especially in Western Europe, uh, the United States. So th these countries that are really, have, have big budgets, uh, especially from the, from the public perspective. And this kind of dictates the talk of efficiency for the rest of the world, because I can say that from the margins of the EU, nobody talks about efficiency at Croatian universities. So they want to reform the universities to behave like they do uh, in Europe. And they're, they're, they're thinking, if we have a problem with, with uh, efficiency being imposed, that's a good problem, right? So rethinking what does it mean to have these funding stream function in this way and project values that trump all others 
is exactly the kind of question that I think open science advocates should be addressing and proposing models to, to solve them in a sense. Do each of you have uh, comments or questions on each other's presentations that you'd like to raise or broader issues uh, that deserve some uh, discussion across thematically across the sessions? Yeah, I, I had a question. Um, so uh, Sabina, you had talked a lot about um, uh, you know, framing these these problems uh, in in a geopolitical context as well, and and um, you know, uh, um, one of the things that came to mind uh, for me is thinking about the preprint servers um, that have uh, kind of really proliferated um, in recent years, and uh, you know, the uh, what kind of strikes me me is almost like common sense in a way, but also a little bit odd, is that there are kind of country specific preprint servers. Um, so there's uh, in, um, an Indonesian archive, right? Um, and it's interesting that sort of, I guess, in, in the West, um, they're more discipline specific and, and focused, whereas they're much more, um, you know, uh, uh, situated in like geo, geopolitical locality based on countries. Um, and so I guess one of the things that I'm thinking about is in terms of colonialism and global extraction, um, might that then lend itself to, because, you know, that data has value, right? That data with those, those, those preprints um, that has value and for it to be, you know, is, is there a potential for it then to be a source of um, exploit or, or, or exploitation, I guess, and extraction? Um, really for, for all of you, what do you... I'll think about that. Thank you very much, Kyle. That's a very important question. And of course, it can be related directly to any other open science infrastructure. This is not just preprints. This is data repositories. This is methods repositories. This is materials, code. You know, all of this is affecting the same, in actually, I would say, similar way, broadly speaking. Um, I think the, the issue is to really work depending on, not, maybe not so much even disciplines because discipline can be very, very diverse within them themselves, but in relation to particular objects and objectives of science uh, internationally to think about um, what a more equitable uh, distribution of resources may be. Uh, now, one of the things that we have seen actually, especially in relation to um, a, a preprint repositories in the East and the South of Europe is that especially those repositories that were geared towards translating at least the title and the abstracts of papers into English ended up in fact providing a lot of visibility and um, making uh, it possible for researchers doing local work to acquire better reputation um, in an international um, environment. And so th there can be a lot of benefits uh, to this kind of work in that way, particularly when it's sensitive to linguistic differences and cultural differences. Uh, one of the um, projects I'm doing right now, uh, together with the FAO, uh, the CGR, and several other organizations working in agriculture, is looking at what does it mean to do a data linkage in a responsible way when it comes to agricultural development and plant data. And this is an incredibly difficult space because it's a space which is completely and utterly dripping with post-colonial inequity, uh, where there is a centuries long history of exploitation by certain countries over others. And this is very much to do with the exploitation of uh, materials, germplasm and information and knowledge coming from very often local indigenous communities in those countries. And at the same time, there are uh, really important prospects coming from potentially being able to share uh, information um, globally. And, and so the problem is, in the case of data of that type, very much like in the case of preprints, there is actually still very little recognition that there are very significant ethical issues coming with um, extracting data from one particular territory and bringing it to another. So one of the things we are working on is to think about how this kind of digital uh, well, digital information can be uh, subjected to potentially a uh, governing uh, rules or at the very least some sort of protection at the international level in the same way in which uh, uh, plant materials, germ plants has been in the past, right? And in fact, there are treaties around this. I think there's just a lot of work to be done uh, towards, uh, and it's possible 
to try and think about this in a way that's uh, solid and responsibly international. But this means acknowledging the problem in the first place. And that's where the open science technology can be a double-edged sword. I mean, it, it pushed the, you know, it highlights how important it is to find ways of sharing um, these kinds of knowledge, but at the same time, uh, it can be used to uh, obliterate the gigantic social issues that emerge when you start to do the sharing at the global level. May I um, ask a question of Berna? So, Please, Dave. Uh, Berna, I think, um, I, th I think um, you are the only uh, panelist here who is doing, you know, uh, quantitative work in this area, yeah. which I think in a way uh, makes you very helpful because I think a lot of people that would um, instinctively uh, dismiss a lot of critiques or, or contextualizations of meta science right. would be much more interested in, in potentially reading your work and, and, and sort of, you know, um, uh, filtering the critiques through this kind of more palatable uh, means. But uh, one thing that I was wondering about is um, in the kind of model that you set up for, um, for replication, uh, yeah. It seems like the um, the focus is mainly, or, or or the kind of variability is mainly um, sampling variability, and uh, one of the issues that I have, especially um, in talking to biologists, and actually Sabina might um, might have something to say about this as well, is that the problem is not necessarily um, sampling variability, as it is uh, one that there are a lot of um, variabilities in uh, like, uh, like the technological setups and the existence of of like or the accessibility of certain reagents or the accessibility right. of certain skills. And so I'm wondering, like, are those sort of um, things, are they amenable to the kind of analysis that you're doing or, um, or is, it, is it too hard to, to, um, to, to try to uh, like include that in the type of simulations or is that, is it just an impossibility? Like, like how would that work? I mean, I, I, I think probably it's an impossible to include all kinds of error, but uh, it's something that we actively try to, um, examine actually because sampling variability is oftentimes the only type of variables that comes to mind when people are talking about um, lack of reproducibility of say true results so one of the comments that we receive is yeah of course there's you know like potential for type one error but that's not what we we are talking about of course there's that but that aside there are so many different types of error that answer that's why we um, started out by identifying this um, or, or, or trying to formalize this idea of a study because all of the components that I identified starting from background knowledge that you bring in to um, the models that you consider as your proposed models and under which you make inference to um, the, your choice of statistical methods or um, design choices that you make to the um, sampling issues like random sampling versus non-random sampling, all of these bring in further sources of error. And in our simulations, basically, um, we try to identify how much more complicated all of these can make the problem of identifying um, a, a true results from false results or identifying um, whether something holds based on reproducible tail loan. So yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Sampling error is just one type of error, but oftentimes, especially um, in experimental research, what we have is a lot of model misspecification. That's a source of error, and it kind of um, you don't know how your statistical methods behave. We oftentimes don't have random sampling. We have biased um, samples that kind of change everything because all of the statistical inference that you make, all of the statistical guarantees that you um, have are based on the assumption of um, identical independent um, um, observation, independent distribution, uh, distributed observations. So yeah, the, the, there are so many different elements that can be, uh, that can mess up your results and your interpretation of those results and interpretation of replication studies as well. It's important to account for at least some of them in our models, we try to do that, but of course the, um, at the system level, there are so many variables and you just have to make some assumptions. It's impossible to model everything. It would be intractable, I guess. Yeah. Great point, though. 
Steve Goodman raises a question that applies to everyone. Uh, he says, this is focusing a lot on the theoretical framework of meta-science. I would like to pose two challenges to the presenters. What would you think is the most important topic skill to be taught to young scientists? You can specify the discipline. Uh, and what is the one most important institutional change to improve the validity or efficiency of the science they do? And you can avoid efficiency if you like. Um, if, if it's okay, I think I might um, maybe for the first one, the most important topic skill for young scientists. Um, I, I kind of want to come back to where I'd started with um, thinking about reflexivity, maybe. And um, specifically, Jane Rosky's uh, re uh, research on history of psychology that, that um, Ivan also cited, and why you know we tend to see less of an infusion of, of reflexivity and um, taking seriously the significance of our own subjectivity and the observations that we make um, in in other disciplines. So I don't know if, if reflexivity um, is kind of a skill to develop, but um, I know, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's definitely sort of started to gain a little bit of steam, right, with, uh, with quantum mechanics, right, and, and Niels Bohr and his insight, you know, that the simple observation of, of uh, subatomic particles um, can change their activity, right, um, but, you know, that sort of, I guess, if it's a skill has really been, um, uh, uh, I guess, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it can even be, you know, like distilled into a skill. I don't know. <laughs> it's a really good question. Though. I like that. I may make a suggestion about skills too. And um, these, of course, are very difficult questions. Um, and I think for me, it's probably how to have to be transdisciplinarity. And, and that is not in opposition to hyper-specialization. I think we are stuck with being specialized. That's the way uh, the world of science is uh, proceeding. Um, things get more complex. Um, we have more and more methods. It makes sense that there are very specific ways of specializing and acquiring technical skills. But I think the problem is very often uh, researchers are trained, and I've seen it in many institutions, to think that the moment they specialize, they basically lose the ability to communicate with people who have uh, different specialties. It can come from different perspectives, which is the opposite of what I think they should be trained in. I mean, they should really be trained. And there are ways to do this, uh, I think, um, to use their point of view, their specialty, to contribute to projects which have many different types of expertise and perspectives involved in them, and to seek those kinds of problems. Uh, but I think very often we're educating people to shy away from those kinds of projects, and that is really disastrous, I would say. Institutional changes, uh, anything that can help that, and this is not going to be one. Yeah, I, I think this is a really difficult question because everybody's going to suggest whatever is coming from their corner, and we think we need, it needs to impo be imposed on the scientists. And I think many of us don't think stuff needs to be imposed, right? And curricula are all, already overburdened, so teaching more programming or reflexivity, et cetera, just, just going to overburden it even more. I think my perspective here, and Kyle stole it from me, I wanted to say reflexivity too, uh, being informed by Joe Morales's work too. Um, and I think this is a problem that historians of psychology really feel uh, very strongly um, because there's comparatively very few of us uh, and many work within psych departments and um, um, psychologists, especially quantitative psychologists who dominate most departments are uh, very, Mm, reluctant to engage with perspectives of historians, let's put it like that. So I think it would go a long way um, to kind of beef up uh, reflexive thinking about methods, reflexive thinking about theories, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do that by exposing students and grad students to history, to philosophy, to STS, to, uh, or different kinds of interdisciplinarity uh, to begin with. Uh, what to change institutionally? Um, I'm always, um, I always come back to this point from, from a, a, a paper by Andy Pickering about uh, the discovery of weak currents in, in, in physics um, in, in the 60s, I think, that happened. And he describes this interaction between experimentalists and theoreticians uh, in particle physics. Um, and this always struck me as 
where are the theoreticians in psychology uh, as an organized group? Uh, like this dictate of uh, or mandate of producing empirical work to participate in the conversation. I think this really is part of this problem with of reflexivity that, that psychology proper and many subject areas in psychology have. So uh, changing that institutionally in some way, either through teaching or through uh, securing space in, in journals from, for really either theoretical formalizations like they're being suggested now or different kind of synthetic work, that is work. So that's not literature reviewing. I think that's a, that's a way to go at least for psychology. Any other reactions to that prompt? Um, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go no, ahead. No, 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 sorry. Okay, so I, I um, with regards to um, the skill, it's a very interesting question and I agree both with uh, you, Kyle and, and Sabina, that reflexible, uh, reflexivity and transdisciplinarity both matter a lot. I was thinking more on the uh, maybe closer to reflexivity, one thing that I think could be cultivated. I don't think it can be taught. I, I don't think it needs to be part of programs, but um, as individual researchers, something that we can work on, cultivated on cultivating on ourselves is um, awareness of assumptions, assumptions of the field that we operate in, assumptions of the research that we need, that we read, assumptions of um, that we ourselves have when we're thinking about issues, a lot of times we do not know, like a lot of times we don't, don't think about what we assume when we're um, formulating a research question, when we come up with a model, when we're reading about the models or results that we um, are exposed to. I think questioning them is important. First, identifying them at the beginning. I think it's, um, it's a hard skill to cultivate and um, it's very important to develop some kind of awareness so once we're aware, then we can start questioning whether they make sense or not. But um, a lot of times we're not even um, aware that we have assumptions that other people don't have or don't share. So that's what I want to say. And Kyle, did you have a, any follow up there? Yeah, so, so I, I kind of wanted to follow up on the, uh, the institutional part as well, because it does occur to me that one really significant in institutional change that open, you know, open science advocates can really push for is to more explicitly ally themselves with the student debt cancellation movement, right, and to abolish student debt. Because, you know, one of the things that, that occurs to me is, you know, the, the types of questions that are being asked in labs and the types of methodological pursuits and the type of data that's coming out of that is coming out of extremely precarious casual working conditions for many folks, right? Um, Tom asked a question about the casualization ex exploitation of um, knowledge workers. And this isn't necessarily, of course, a new problem, but I think there tends to be a kind of you know, uh, aura that surrounds the idea of the, you know, the starving student as artist, right, um, toiling away in the lab, um, you know, unable to afford food. But like most other sources of misery, it's been intensified and accelerated, right, under contemporary capitalism. And we've reached a full crisis where if, if you know, the knowledge workers within those, those spheres are constantly stressed out about what is it, how are they going to survive, how are they going to reproduce the conditions of their own life, they're, not only are they they're kind of come out with boring science, right, safe science, right, reproducing kind of just the same, you know, stuff not really breaking ground because they know it'll get them a job, but also, you know, they're going to be exhausted and they're going to kind of produce awful science too, I would think. So that's, I mean, that's kind of one key institutional push that really we can push for is open science advocates for sure, I think. Thank you for that, Kyle. Uh, looking at the time, I think we can do one more big picture question uh, that maybe everybody will have uh, some comment on. Uh, and this is a theme that was most explicit in Ivan and David's presentations, but really uh, was apparent in all of them. And that is that there's clear heterogeneity in the motivations of reformers, things that 
are the passions that they have or perspectives that they are advancing, and also in the desired end states, right? Is it, is it rigor? Is it efficiency? Is it transparency for its own end? Is it democratization? What are the challenges and opportunities that you perceive from your perspective of reform having, embracing that heterogeneity or uh, end up not being able to advance uh, because of those differing motivations? Um, I think um, I can speak from personal experience here. I think uh, so. I, I, I'm uh, I'm trained as a psychologist, and in, in my PhD, I moved to history and philosophy of science, and I worked on history of 20th century psychology. Um, and I found it extremely liberating in that sense to move from a psych department to a really interdisciplinary institute where I was talking every day to everybody from a historian of biology to a philosopher of quantum mechanics and everything in between, right? Um, and I realized that that wasn't accessible to how I was trained. And in the beginning, I thought that's because you come from a relatively provin provincial marginal university in Eastern Europe. So of course that wasn't accessible to you. But then when you read about disciplinary formation of psychology in general uh, in 20th century, the psychology is really closed off. Um, and there are moments where this changes. The cognitive revolution is a great example where something broke off and this kind of interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity did things to how people thought, right? So I think this driving this point of epistemic diversity and any other kind of diversity within an open science movement that wants to reform a discipline like psychology, I think it's really crucial um, in making these perspectives accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, this is, of course, extremely difficult, I think. I think we need to be trained. We need to be explicitly taught intellectual humility. Um, so this comes with experience of interacting with different perspectives on the same subjects, right? Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but I think this should be, like I would put diversity, epistemic and any other as really a central issue for the reform movement to actually be successful. How to do that, I am unsure myself. So we have read the criticisms of mandating things and using central institutions to change things. Those are really strategically efficient, but they produce a lot of effects that are unintended. And I think that's a million dollar question, kind of how to do it efficiently, how to uh, form a movement that's grassroots, but also uh, strategically efficient in uh, um, instilling change within this uh, insanely complicated and uh, distributed system of research, right? If I could just make a quick comment here. I mean, I think the biggest, um, the biggest danger, I think, the biggest anxiety that I have about this whole meta science movement is that it somehow becomes essentially an independent field where people can be raised intellectually entirely through meta science without having to go through discipline. To me, I think that uh, represents an enormous risk because um, I think just as, as all the panelists have talked about, uh, there is a great value in really knowing the science itself and, and, and appreciating the differences between sciences. As far as the possibility to kind of flip side of that, I think is that the meta science itself, I think in as much as it can interact with, you know, sort of a traditional field like the social studies of science, which, you know, already has this kind of rich tradition and, you know, infuse it with a lot of new energy, with, with new methods, with new perspectives and maintain, um, you know, as Ivan was just talking about, a focus on not just, um, not just uh, diversity, but also a sort of contextual understanding that science is occurring within a particular political and economic and institutional moment. And so I think, you know, in as much as uh, meta science can be that space where we can have these cross disciplinary conversations, but, uh, like we're doing right now, I think that represents really, um, I think, a, an exciting goal for it, um, which I think would would uh, would you know um, would be far preferable to a kind of you know narrowly focused meta science, which is you know really becomes almost like a, a bureaucratic or managerial force.
any other yes, follow-ups to that or closing? Sabina, please. Sorry, just I wonder, you know, just directly responds to uh, David's point. Indeed, I, I was really glad to um, to be part of this symposium and grateful to Brian and, and his colleagues for organizing it, partly because to be honest, I had also understood to meta science to be a very formal quantitative approach uh, to these issues. And so, in fact, it was an open question for me participating here, to which extent can we bring together these more qualitative and quantitative approaches, these questions of social critique uh, with what um, what is being done in the field. So I'm really glad to see that there can be this dialogue and this can be a step towards, uh, towards doing this. And in terms of, um, you know, the fear that um, thinking about diversity may in fact dilute um, goals like openness so much that they become impractical. I think we have a lot of good examples of this really not being the case. I mean, as a very, very practical example, uh, when Plan S was launched by Coalition S a couple of years ago, it was launched without a lot of consultation, actually. And they did uh, do a consultation after their launch. They received more than 600 responses. And these were incredibly helpful responses. And we're still working, and I'm, I'm now working at Plan S Ambassador, uh, with Coalition S to try and keep modifying the system that initially devised to respond to this. It, to be entirely honest, I also think quite a lot of the points that were raised in a consultation would have been easily um, you know, it would have been easy to spot if there had been attention to the diversity of scientific practices to start with. I mean, the fact that Plan S was going to affect adversely and dramatically badly the humanities should have been clear from its inception, right? Things like that. So I think there is a place for regular consultations and regular um, understand attempts to understand how things are evolving in different contexts, but it's also quite important to try and do a little bit of due diligence when launching a big initiative, because uh, I think rather than diluting its effect, it can really magnify this and make it much more effective, if you want to use this word. Very good. Any final comments before we close? Okay, excellent. Well. Thank you, panelists. This was a fantastic uh, discussion, broad ranging and deep simultaneously. Thank you to the attendees uh, for coming uh, and engaging with this. All of these questions, there were many, many more uh, than what we were able to get to. Uh, hopefully those will continue to stimulate in positive engagement uh, in social media and otherwise uh, as we wrestle with these issues. Uh, and there is still a lot more work to do. So consider, uh, uh, putting submissions in for MetaScience 2021 uh, and for attending uh, yourself. The submission process is not open yet, so you're not missing anything, uh, but that will be coming uh, soon so that we can have more uh, discussions and learning uh, like this. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, have a great rest of the day or sleep or wherever you are.